Hello, um, everybody. We are very pleased to welcome you to the Energy Data Workshop uh, for the MENA region, organized by the International Energy Agency, in collaboration with uh, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia and the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. My name is Roberta Quadrelli. I'm working at the Energy Data Center of the International Energy Agency. We do have um, a couple of um, logistic explanations for you just uh, before the meeting. Uh, this is a virtual meeting only, and uh, the training will be recorded, but only the part with the presentations of the speakers. This is to allow more users later to, to access the um, material. Um, we do have French and Arabic interpretation during the presentations, and you could test already to select the language by clicking on the interpretation tab at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, we would uh, like to encourage you to keep the microphones turned off during the presentations of other speakers. However, uh, feel really free to ask questions, either by raising your virtual hand or writing in the special Q&A section you find also at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, yes, with this, I think um, we can have a brief uh, overview uh, of the agenda. Um, for those who attended our three-day statistic training before, um, this will be a deepening of the subjects um, because we have looked already at fundamentals of energy statistics. However, we we'll look at uh, a review of the fundamental of energy statistics and other areas, as you see in the agenda, to touch uh, several topics during this uh, discussion. However, I really wanted uh, to uh, give the floor to our um, speakers for the opening remarks. On the side of the IEA, we have Dr. Nick Johnston, the chief statistician of the International Energy Agency, followed by a few words from Mr. Nadim Abilama, uh, who is uh, working also at the IEA in the clean energy tran transitions and global energy relations. For uh, ESQA, we'll have Dr. Wafa Abul Hosn, chief of the economic statistics section. And for RECRE, we'll have Mrs. Nadia. Shiuk, who is International Cooperation and Communication Manager. So thank you very much for joining once again. And Nick, the floor is yours for the opening. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta. It's a, uh, it's a great honor for me to open uh, this workshop. I know that many of you, as, as Roberta mentioned, have participated in the IEA Energy Statistics Training Week earlier this week. Uh, and uh, that was our 26th uh, training week, but this is our first dedicated training session in the MENA region, and it's of great value and importance to us uh, to have had this opportunity, for which I would sincerely like to thank uh, uh, both Dr. Abul Houston and, uh, and Nadia Shuk. Uh, for the collaboration and helping us put it together. Uh, it's of extraordinary importance to the IEA. Uh, I'm also happy to see that we have participation from over 50 different energy users and generators. And I think that's quite important. We've got a nice combination, nice diversity, both in terms of the countries that are represented, the ministries and the agencies, as well as the role that they play in the data cycle. Uh, because that, of course, is what we at the IEA focus on, the links between data and good policies. Without good data, you cannot have good policies. Uh, and for us, the foundation stone is lies with data and statistics and the quality of data and statistics. Uh, we work with over 150 countries around the globe. Uh, but we're particularly keen to work with the MENA region for a number of reasons. First of all, it's an extraordinarily important region for uh, both energy consumption and production. Uh, it is pivotal in the global energy landscape. Moreover, 
We have the COP28 coming up to be held uh, in UAE. So having this workshop just a couple months prior to the COP uh, is, of course, extremely timely. And also, of course, we have association countries in the region. By association countries, we mean part of the broader IEA family, beyond just our, uh, our members. Increasingly, we are reaching out across the globe to make the IEA, the formal IEA family, uh, as broad as possible. Uh, and in the region, we, of course, have Egypt and Morocco as, uh, as, 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 as association countries. But we're working with all countries across the region uh, to help further develop our data, ensure that it is of high quality, uh, timely, uh, and accessible, so that, as mentioned previously, policymakers are in a situation to put in place the most efficient policies as they shift towards the green, the clean energy transition. We know that MENA region is facing several important uh, challenges, such as increasing demand, environmental concerns, and involving market dynamics. Uh, it is one of the regions in the world that is most affected uh, by climate change. Uh, which puts further strain on energy demand by, for example, boosting the demand for cooling. Uh, I make these points because it's important for us to see these exercises as two-way streets. It's not a question of us sharing our knowledge with you. It's a question of us sharing our knowledge with you and learning from you so that together we can improve the quality of the data at the regional level so that globally we have a better system of how, a better understanding of how energy systems are changing. So I want to emphasize the fact that for us, it is very much seen as a two-way street. Having participated, for those of you who participated in the statistics training week and participated in this workshop, makes you part of a broader community of energy statisticians across the globe uh, who are helping all governments be in a situation to have the data foundation to design uh, better policies going forward. Final point I would like to, to reiterate is I would very much like to, to thank once again the United uh, Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia uh, and the Regional Centre for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency for collaboration with respect to this. We have partnerships uh, with individual countries, we have contacts in individual countries, but it's also through bodies, whether they be thematic or regional, such as your own, uh, that helps us ensure that our reach is as broad as possible and that we're not duplicating efforts, that we're learning together. Uh, so if I might, I might turn over the floor now to Nadim uh, to say a few words about the structure of the workshop of course, before, of course, we hear from our collaborating partners. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you. Am I am I heard? <clears throat> no. Yes. Yes. Um, so thank you all, and, and thank you Nick and and Roberta for for these few words, and thank you all uh, to all the participants for <clears throat> attending this training. So um, also in a difficult uh, context. Um, uh, for the region, as <clears throat> as you all know, uh, and as was has been mentioned before, energy is a key element of economic development, and statistics is what underpins that. Um, and this workshop is also the opportunity to provide more targeted support to the region on energy statistics. And I would encourage you to take an active role by asking questions and highlighting how you would like this training to benefit you based on your specific domestic challenges. So in terms of the structure of this workshop, so there will be short presentations. They cover common basic principles of energy statistics, both at country and regional levels. And um, you know, they would support national statisticians in enhancing their practice through other countries' international experience. So not only this is uh, also, as Nick mentioned, a two-way street, but also between um, entities and institutions uh, working based on the region. Uh, you know, some of you have already attended the Energy, uh, IE energy statistics training um, in, uh, earlier this week, and you would uh, know what the benefits are for 
what some people could call South-South cooperation, but we can call it also intra-regional cooperation and exchange of experiences, because many of you already uh, face similar challenges. So uh, without um, the benefit of time and without delaying the start of the workshop, I'd like to wish you a very fruitful uh, day. And again, as mentioned before, please do not hesitate to actively participate. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Wafa Abu Dhabi, you can now open for, for uh, uh, the UN, uh, UN Square, if you can hear me. Okay, yes, I hear you. I hope you're hearing us. You can hear us, okay. So uh, we welcome you uh, from our side for this webinar, our team in statistics and technology and the energy team in ESQUA. Uh, ESQUA, again, is the Regional Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia and Arab countries. Um, we have been working forever with our partners with UNSB, IEA, OAPE, CRECRI, and IEF on the initiative. We thank IEA for the opportunity to have a dedicated day for the MENA region. Uh, our region, as uh, was mentioned by Nick uh, and Nadine, is very important and resourceful at the global level. And this is maybe one of the reasons that this region is at the center of war and conflict, unfortunately. Uh, I want to uh, just remind maybe our uh, participants who maybe joined us uh, in many trainings uh, previously. We were lucky to have uh, consecutive projects on energy statistics and balance. We had the DA project from 2011 to 2014. We succeeded together to uh, organize reg uh, a regional training for trainers on energy statistics in Oman. Uh, other uh, regional training in Abu Dhabi hosted by uh, the statistics office there. Uh, we did national workshops in Yemen, Iraq, Egypt, and uh, a few trainings on the joint uh, uh, oil data initiative. Also, the Islamic Development Bank provided us with a, with a project to target the energy use in the transport sector. It was only for three countries, Jordan, Egypt, and Palestine. And it was targeted to undertake a field surveys uh, to estimate energy use in transport. And uh, the, the project ended with um, like uh, the results were used in policy in the three countries. And, we were very happy to see uh, that you know, uh, energy policies were taken uh, as per the results that were obtained in the project. Uh, again, a third project, uh, ADA, on uh, SDGs, uh, together with UNSD and the regional commissions, we were able to provide uh, national workshop and technical support to Lebanon in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, again, during those projects, we tried to uh, provide the training material that was developed by IEA and UNSD in Arabic. This is very important for our member countries. Uh, the training material of the uh, IEA, uh, IEA uh, training on energy statistics, uh, the presentations and the exercises were all translated into Arabic. And uh, we hosted at the uh, the, the, the the material for participants to to be able to um, uh, practice on their own uh, e-learning uh, course. Uh, other material that we translated are the International Energy Statistics um, Recommendations, the IRIS, and the Energy Accounts, which is also hosted and can be accessed anytime for our uh, participants who want to, uh, to join. We, uh, we also uh, insisted to have both statistical offices and uh, energy for our, um, uh, during our meetings. It's important to have users and producers and this dialogue between both. And uh, for this specific webinar, we suggested to our partners to add a session on energy data from trade flows. Our colleague, uh, Majid Hamoud, who is with us today, the team leader of trade stats, will be presenting. And we thank him uh, for developing this platform that can inform a lot on energy flows. Uh, a lot of time, uh, even like um, uh, staff in the statistics offices or energy, they don't have access to this uh, detailed trade data. And uh, what we're trying here with our team is to really uh, work in the details, uh, even like in all in all products, and then the demonstration on this. We also suggested to have a, a presentation on technology applications 
to assess and estimate solar energy using satellite imagery and other geospatial tools. Um, Christophe Rohana from our team did the research and will be, will be presenting a use case. So we wish you all uh, the best of luck mm -hmm. and we hope you will benefit from this um, webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wafa, and I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Nadia Shuk for the opening from Reke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is Nadia Shuk, Director of International Cooperation at the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and uh, Energy Efficiency. Uh, pleased and uh, happy to be with you to get today for this uh, workshop on energy data in the, in the MENA region. Um, I thank you. I thank uh, our partners, uh, the uh, International uh, Energy Agency, the UNS, uh, for this uh, opportunity once again to collaborate uh, together. Uh, of course, uh, as you know, the energy uh, plays a, a, a crucial role uh, in driving economic growth. Uh, Mr. Uh, Johnston has, uh, has shown the uh, the importance of uh, the accurate and the reliable uh, energy data in uh, elaborating uh, energy energy policies, uh, so uh, it's also an important uh, issue uh, for us. The Regional Center for uh, Renewable Energy and uh, Energy Efficiency is uh, the uh, intergovernmental institution uh, that aims to, to enable uh, and increase the adoption of renewable energy and energy efficiency in the uh, in the Arab regions. Uh, it partners with uh, with regional governments and uh, global organization to uh, initiate and and lead the clean energy policy uh, dialogue and strategies and technologies and capacity development in our region. And uh, today we are uh, happy to partner with uh, the. Um, International Energy Agency and uh, the UNESCO to deliver this workshop that aims to foster the knowledge in the into uh, the field of energy uh, data. So uh, please, uh, in this context, I, I, I would like to uh, see this opportunity to introduce our uh, recently launched report. So uh, the Arab Future Energy Index, APEX 2023. So the report that assesses and ranks the progress in performance of the Arab countries in the field of renewable energy and energy efficiency. So uh, these are 2023 uh, conducted by the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Recree in collaboration and partnership with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, uh, is a comprehensive tool that provides valuable uh, insights into the region's transition uh, towards sustainable energy. Uh, for this time, this edition of AFEX uh, covers the three pillars of uh, sustainable uh, energy, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and electricity access. Uh, renewable energy, uh, for uh, it will assess its uh, the progress in 20 Arab countries uh, under more than 40 indicators, focused mainly on policies, strategies, institutional and technical capacities, and also investment environments. For the APEX 2023 this year, the APEX is becoming an effective tool uh, for the policymakers in the Arab uh, region. And I warmly encourage all the, the participants in this workshop to use this, uh, this document as a supporting tool for, uh, for, your, uh, for your works. Uh, this is uh, just a small introduction about uh, the APEX uh, 2023. Uh, uh, it's uh, a good opportunity to introduce it to all the participants. Uh, thank you very much. I encourage all the participants to actively engage in, in, in discussions and uh, through the different uh, exercises session. Thank you for being here and I wish you a productive and enriching workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia and uh, Wafa and Nick. Um, I think the IA is very, very pleased of this collaboration uh, with important institutions in the region, or if you want to dedicate a specific uh, attention to the region. And um, just before the starting, so I would like to thank the opening speakers uh, once again. And just before starting uh, the workshop, uh, we have a couple of questions for uh, our participants. I'm giving the floor to Karim. 
because we wanted to understand a little bit more uh, the background of the audience, given that we cannot have you all uh, physically in the same room with us. Karen. Uh, thank you, Roberta. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, we prepared a brief uh, um, interactive uh, survey on Menti, and we will be using this throughout the uh, workshop. So if you could please uh, open a second screen, this could be your cell phone or uh, a new tab on your uh, browser and go, go to menti.com and enter the code. Or alternatively, you could scan the QR code as well. Give participants a few seconds to join. And uh, once you join, you could see the code uh, on the top of the screen throughout the presentation. We'd just like to get to know the geographic coverage. Uh, today, most of you are joining from the MENA region, but we know we have participants all over the globe, so we'd like to get an idea. You can read the code. Yeah. So the code, I'll repeat the code. It is 4878-6728. We have people from the United Arab Emirates, Lebanon, Tunisia. We have UN participants. We have people from Oman, Tunisia, Algeria. We have people from Paris. Yep, the, our next question would be uh, about the, the as, as you know, the IA uh, held an energy statistics course uh, between 9 and 11 October. We want to uh, know if the participants here attended the, the training. Yeah, we have some people that attended the training for all the three days. So it will be useful to it, it will be useful to improve your understanding of uh, fundamental statistics. And uh, this training will be in addition to the training that we already held. So it will be useful. And lastly, we'd like to understand uh, what's your role at your current institution. I know that we have a lot of people Action. We have energy analysts, we have people working on data, we have directors, we have a sustainable engineer intern. We have a research associate. We have statisticians. Um, yeah, we have people working on energy and environment statistics. So it seems like we have a diverse uh, group of people here. And uh, now I'll uh, give it back to Roberta to introduce the first presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karim. And um, just uh, reminding to all participants, this platform uh, that is www.menti.com requires the code that we wrote in the chat. Uh, we will use it also across the different presentations, so it may be an opportunity to express uh, some opinions or uh, respond to some quizzes later on. So please uh, try to get familiar, uh, if you can, by testing the, the website uh, uh, as it is written in the chat. And with this, thank you, Karen. Um, I like to open the content as part of the workshop with what we consider very important, which is the fundamental of energy statistics and balances. Wafa already introduced the importance of the international recommendations 
of energy statistics and we'll, we'll review the key concepts um, that are necessary for us to speak this language of uh, energy data. So I'm inviting our speakers from the International Energy Agency, Nicola Draghi, uh, also with Mark Kadunovas, and uh, they will run this session um, on fundamentals of energy statistics and the balances. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roberta, for the introduction. Um, I'm showing now the screen, so I hope you can see that correctly. And I'll start the presentation. I hope also that you can hear me well. So uh, again, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. I am Nicola, Nicola Draghi, and I'm a, an energy data officer within the annual energy statistics team at the IA. So together with my colleague, Mark casanova Simo, we will uh, first go through this presentation on fundamental of energy statistics and balances, and then there will be an exercise session. So let's start from our reference for energy statistics, which is uh, IRES. We already mentioned that several times the International Recommendation for Energy Statistics developed by the UN in collaboration with many organizations, among which the IA. So these guidelines set uh, um, important information and definition regarding energy statistics, the collection, quality assurance checks, dissemination, and most importantly, they give us an ambiguous definition in order to speak globally the same language as Roberta said before when talking about energy statistics and balances. Now, the definition of energy products is based on uh, CIEC, the Standard International Energy Product Classification, and states, as you can read in the slide, that energy products are forms of energy suitable for direct use or for release of energy while undergoing chemical uh, or other processes, chemical transformation and so on. Instead, energy flows are based on the International Standard Industrial Classification, ISIC, and it's interesting to highlight here production, which can be attributed to any economic unit, including households, and energy sector uh, on use, and well, energy sector as a whole, uh, where we speak about economic units whose main activity is not only energy production, but also transformation and distribution. Now, energy statistics are generally collected for one or more energy products pertaining to the same, let's say, group of products, can be uh, oil, can be coal, can be electricity. Uh, all of them are put all together, let's say, in the energy balance which is an accounting framework for compilation of data on all the energy products which enter or exit and then are also used within the national territory of a country during a reference period, which is usually a calendar year. So you can see here the, an example of an energy balance matrix. It is indeed a bidimensional matrix with products in the column dimension and flows instead in the horizontal dimension, in, uh, in the rows. So already by looking uh, at this, we can see that every column is a commodity balance in energy units of uh, a given, uh, a given uh, uh, product indeed. Whereas in the rows, we can already compare the contribution of uh, different product for the same use or origin of, uh, of energy, but also the interrelationship and conversions from one product to, uh, to the others. Then uh, the most important things about energy balances indeed is the fact that all these products are reported in the same energy unit. There are always the case of energy balances at the IA. And then we have also, because of this uh, comparable energy unit, we have the possibility to calculate a total column where we have the sum of all uh, the contribution of all the products. So in other words, looking at the balance, we have a complete picture of the situation of the energy system of a country for a given year. So the balance is divided into three blocks. The first one is the supply blocks that goes from production to stock change, and that it's recapped in the total energy supply uh, row. Then we have the transformation and energy industry on use block, and the final consumption block, which are generally referred as the 
demand. Let's now look at the most important flows of, of the balance, and we start from production. The quantity to be reported in this flow are those that are uh, the remains that are uh, accounted after cleaning and removal of any impurities. So the quantities that are ready to be sold on the market. Uh, this means for oil and natural gas that we do not consider the production directly at the well. And for example, for natural gas, we exclude the gas that is flared, vented, or re-injected for operational purposes. And for oil, we exclude all the impurities uh, that are removed at the, at the gathering center or in any pretreatment of crude oil. However, we include here in production the quantities which are consumed by the producer in the production process in order to keep the equipment uh, on to, to, for example, for eating or for running all the machines in order to, to extract these uh, fuels. Um, an important clarification pertaining to, to production is the distinction between field and plant condensates, where the emphasis is put on the production process. So crude oil include condensates recovered from associated and not associated gas fields at field separation facilities that then are transported together with the crude oil to, to the next uh, station, let's say, to the refinery and so on. Instead, plant condensate are generally removed from natural gas in more complex natural gas processing plants, and they should be reported together with NGLs. Um, for trade, it's very important to clearly define the boundaries of energy statistics. So what we consider imports is energy products entering a country for domestic supply, so to be used within the country. Instead, for exports, we should report the amount of products which are domestically produced and then leave the country. So if we follow this uh, definition, transit trade is excluded, which means, for example, that if a country imports five kilotons of crude oil and then export the same quantity without having touched uh, that crude oil, then this should not be considered for trade for this specific country. Here we have some scenarios that um, clarify the situation and are some examples of what could happen. Anyway, we know that in this situation, there can be several particular cases pertaining to one country or another. So if you are unsure about where to report uh, or whether to report or not specific trade, uh, you can always contact us for support. Now, there are two exceptions to the definition above. The first one is for LNG. Now. For LNG, the country of origin, it's not the country where the natural gas was produced and eventually liquefied, but it's the country where the uh, uh, LNG is regasified into natural gas. So for example, if country A is produced and liquefied natural gas, this is transported via boat to country B, where it's regasified and then exported to country C via pipelines, then for uh, country C, the origin of the gas will be country B. And for country B, obviously, the destination of uh, the export will be country C. Another exemption is for uh, electricity and heat, where the uh, trade flows reported are the one uh, that cross the border and do not follow the origin and destination rule that we uh, described before. And this way, uh, we include also transit trade, and this is because electricity and heat as energy vector are, uh, let's say, different from coal, oil, and natural gas. So, for example, if a company in France uh, buys some electricity from uh, an electricity producer in Portugal, then despite the initial origin of the electricity is Portugal and the final destination is, is France, Portugal will report export to Spain, Spain will report import and export to France, and France will report imports from uh, Spain. Moving on to another very important flows, that's international marine and aviation bankers. And in particular, I want to put the emphasis on 
marine bunkers. And this is because marine bunkers are very important uh, for the demand of oil in a country because global trade happens uh, mostly by, by sea. And it's very important to uh, uh, define whether the consumption happens in domestic or international, uh, or international navigation. Now, the split between the two, domestic and international, should be determined on the basis of the port and airport for aviation, of departure and arrival. So it has nothing to do with the flag or the ownership of the airline undertaking these, uh, these voyages. And also for, uh, for consumption in fishing, uh, this is covered elsewhere in the balance. In final energy consumption, actually, we have a, a fishing uh, uh, row, a fishing flow. So it shouldn't be reported the, the consumption of this vessel into international marine bunkers. Moving to the transformation block, I want to show you a very important uh, convention that we have, a sign convention, that it's the fact that inputs of a transformation process are reported with a negative sign. So for example, here we have the example of uh, an electricity plant whose input is natural gas reported with a negative sign, and the output is electricity reported with a positive sign. Obviously, here you see uh, the total electricity produced by all the inputs, so the value is very high compared to the input of natural gas. Um, and then in the in the column total, you have in the transformation block generally all negative values because that's the column that it's the sum of the contribution of the of the other products before. And you see there uh, the energy lost during the the transformation as a negative figure. Another important concept and distinction is between gross and net production. So gross production of electricity and heat refers to the total output of a facility before any of it is used. However, we know that not all of the produced quantities are transmitted uh, afterwards, but some of this energy is used to heat uh, or give electricity to all the equipment operating and running in the plants. So that amount uh, uh, consumed to support the plant operation is called on use and will be reported in energy industry on use. The reminder, so what is transmitted to the grid, um, it's the net production. Uh, spotlight here on transformation efficiency, which are very important and an immediate check uh, that we can calculate from energy balance to verify that the data we collected makes sense. So as you know, the efficiency is output divided by input, and it's very important to report them in the same energy units. And obviously, in the efficiency calculation, uh, it really depends on the technology used uh, and, and so on, on the age of the plant and many other variables. Um, and obviously, the, this efficiency has some checks uh, that can be done. For example, it cannot be an, an S2 uh, respect some rules. Obviously, efficiency larger than 100% are not plausible. And um, they depend very much on the technology, on the age of the plant. So it's very important to know these uh, variables and also the historical efficiency of a given power plant to know if the data collected for the next year uh, makes sense, are consistent or not. And here you simply see uh, an example of a uh, of a fuel electricity transformation where two type of fuels are used, A and B, uh, or two quantities of the same fuel, and C, the electricity is the output and how to, to calculate that. Uh, this is uh, to this uh, slide on the transformation was to move on then in a very important transformation, obviously, for uh, many countries, which is what happened in uh, refineries, where uh, generally primary oil is converted into secondary oil. And you can see here a list of the oil products collected in energy statistic. Obviously, losses occur in this process. And this means that generally, the refinery intake should be higher than the refinery uh, gross output. However, here, it really depends on uh, the unit we are using for collecting this data. For example, in mass terms, 
which are generally used for energy statistics and in energy terms, as in the energy balances, refinery gains are not uh, possible. But if we collect the data in volumetric units, then gains are actually possible because the, um, the products compared in volumetric units, the output will be usually lighter than the feedstock. So the refinery yield is, again, the refinery output divided by the uh, refinery intake. And it's an indicator which is uh, really important to be monitored because it's, a, it's an important quality check uh, in, indeed. For example, if in one year the refinery yield moves a lot, decreases a lot without clear motives, then it's likely that the data collection of the output is missing some quantities. That's just an example of how to uh, use the refinery yield as a quality check. Still related to the oil sector, we want to highlight another important situation and complicated situation for uh, energy statistics. So on the one end, we have crude oil and also some quantities of NLGs, NGLs, sorry, that undergo traditional refinery processes yielding secondary uh, oil products. Now, the inputs and the outputs of these processes have to be reported in the oil refineries um, row flow in the transformation block. However, it is possible to have some other quantities of NGLs and plant condensate that can be treated in gas processing, gas separation plants, yielding a smaller range of uh, output products, which are generally LPG, ethane, and uh, naphtha. Now, this is some time, let me show you where to report that, but this is some time misreported because the gas facility is in the same complex of the refinery. But it's really important to distinguish these two different processes and the products participating to this uh, separation, to this uh, uh, process should be reported in the transfer row, again, with the corresponding sign. So in this case, you see natural gas liquids with a minus sign and all the uh, secondary output products with a positive sign. Finally, uh, some example for you to show the difference between transformation and energy industry on use. We have oil refinery first. We already went to uh, the transformation, but the energy on use is when some part of these uh, outcome products, for example, fuel oil or refinery gas, are used to support the operation of the pipe and so they're burned to support this, the operation. So they have to be reported as a transformation output and then as a consumption in energy industry on use. A similar thing can happen in uh, coke ovens um, where some output products of coke ovens can be again burned to provide energy to this very energy intensive process. Finally, uh, some examples, uh, sorry, uh, finally we arrived to the last block, the one on uh, uh, final consumption, where we see the sector demand with the disaggregation uh, uh, given provided by ARIS. So we have uh, many different sectors, industry, transport, residential, and so on. Among these, we have non-energy use. So final consumption indeed include non-energy use of energy products. And this is especially important for lorry products, but also natural gas because they are often used as feedstock in the petrochemical and chemical industry to produce plastic, fertilizer, and other products. So what happens is that some of these products, uh, some of these secondary oil products can be used uh, for energy, but some others will be used as feedstock input in chemical and petrochemical plant. The uh, outcomes of this plant will be primary chemicals and they are not energy products, so they are not included in the energy balance. And sometimes we have also uh, a directly output of the refinery as lubricants, uh, paraffin, waxes, and uh, bitumen, and so on, which are uh, already products used for non-energy use. Uh, finally, a special mention for water desalination, which is a process very important in your region. So you already know that there are many technologies using either electricity or heat as a, a source of energy. 
Now, the problem with water desalination is that these plants are often in industrial complexes or uh, within companies that produce also uh, energy together with, uh, with water. So it's challenging to separate the statistics. In case this is possible, and uh, this should be, um, water desalination falls in ISIC Division 36, which, to, to recap, uh, uh, means that it should be reported into commercial and public services. So the energy used for water desalination should be reported into commercial and public services in final energy consumption. And uh, finally, uh, there are many ways to collect data from administrative sources, which are uh, the data generally gathered for non-statistical purposes from uh, various entities as energy regulator, ministries, transmission of uh, uh, electricity operators, and so on. We have surveys that are very important and usually uh, yield very uh, high quality uh, data, for example, on end use of energy, but they are also very costly. So it's important to know what should be the frequency in order to have a good trade-off between cost and benefit. Then direct measuring. Uh, this means, for example, measure of electricity to conventional smart meters of calorific values, and you need to have equipment in place in order to do that, and modeling uh, as a complementary to all the other data collection to fill some uh, data gaps. But that's the case uh, for modeling. You need uh, very robust input data in order to have reliable output. To conclude, uh, aggregate overview of the main flows in the energy balance. Uh, left, we have the supply side. Right, we have the, uh, the demand side, transformation, energy, industrial use, and total final consumption. And as we saw before, uh, there will be different sources and methodologies to collect data, both to the, from the left and from the right side. And so it's very possible also, I would say almost probable, to have a mismatch between the two sides. And this is called statistical difference. And as a general rule of thumb, this should be uh, not more than 5% in order to be acceptable to show a good uh, data quality. Uh, however, uh, I just want to conclude with that. It's possible that you see also stock change as both rows up and down uh, next, to their, uh, next to their box, which means they can be positive or negative. And it can happen that stock change is used as, a, a, let's say, a residual or a mean to, uh, to let's say, uh, uh, return uh, to equilibrate the supply and the demand side. Uh, this shouldn't be done because stock change is a very important indicator, for example, of how tight is the market. And it's a very important metric. And indeed, it's very important to show statistical difference uh, in order to indeed know the, the data quality of your data collection. So thank you very much. Uh, that was it. And uh, uh, feel free to uh, ask questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nicola. And uh, I like your uh, last slide on the supply and demand. Maybe you can go back one. Definitely. Uh, because uh, you gave a lot of information to our participants, but this is nicely summarizing the structure of the overall energy balance. Um, it would be also interesting to know if our participants um, have a knowledge of the or are collecting data for an energy balance. In the meantime, I also reminded that the international recommendations uh, uh, link on the chat uh, because uh, we can find there also the Arabic translation, uh, thanks to the UN. And uh, I think it's important to really refer to the fundamentals um, of this language, both in terms of what products we should collect the data for and what uh, are the flows uh, that are nicely depicted in this, uh, in this slide um, that allow us to follow you know, what happens to these products across the economy and how we can track then um, what happens. So I was, um, I would like to encourage uh, any participants to um, to comment on the energy balance or fundamental of energy statistics, including whether they are familiar or not with the main concepts, because uh, it may depend on the on the background. There is a Q and A um, window, right? Please. 
we would like that uh, the, our participants are not uh, feeling shy to express uh, questions or comments, including whether you didn't understand. Yes, I was a bit fast in some points, so I'm definitely happy um, to, to we, come back. We gave a lot of information, but um, yeah, I have a question because you, Nicola and Mark, you work on the collection of data for many countries uh, across the world, as Nick mentioned before. So looking at this graph, where do you see the major difficulties for countries to collect data for? You are... Uh, experiencing that in your validation work every day so can you yes definitely so um the flows which were introduced at the during the presentation are also some of the obviously of the most important flows the one to pay more attention to and the one where we we can have uh, more uh, more problems i think on the supply side uh well transit trade it's it's a really important topic as well to uh, have the correct reporting of production, obviously. Uh, stocks are another very important topic because we know that they are not easy to to collect. So, uh, I mean, it's it's a difficult uh, data to, to receive. Uh, so I invite every time that, for example, a, a participant or, uh, or, or a data collector doesn't find this information to try to look in all the possible sources and organizations that collect data in order really to, to have an idea of, of this stock, uh, stock change. Um, and finally, also marine uh, bankers and aviation bankers are also a flow that generally it's, uh, it's not easy to collect on, on the countryside. Um, on the demand side, um, I would say that uh, um, especially for country in the MENA region, obviously a refinery uh, as a process, as a transformation, we know it's a very complex process with many things happening, many, uh, many flows uh, and products that enter the refinery and many others that are transformed and go out. So definitely uh, I would indicate that as the main, uh, the main attention and focus point in order to have uh, high quality statistics really to understand what's going on, what are the flows involved, what gets out as a marketable product, as a finished product, and try always to compare what is your input and your output in a given year and also in previous year in order to, to keep consistency and have refinery losses in uh, mass or energy terms, which are not too high and which are consistent uh, over time. You don't want, yeah, there's a question also in the chat. If we cannot separate the, uh, from a bill, if we cannot separate the energy use in desalinated plants, it will be included in the own use of the plant. Do you have any other solution for desalination? Here we go. So uh, thank you, Abir, very much for this question. I mean, desalination, it's a very, uh, uh, difficult topic uh, in order uh, for energy statistics to, to be collected, the, the right energy statistics for, for that. Um, well, the own use of the plant, it's indeed what we want to be reported in commercial and public services. So in case you have, uh, you have it as own use, then you can directly move it to uh, commercial and public services. I know though that your question is as is probably uh, relating to power plants that produce both energy and water. So in that case, obviously, it's very difficult to separate what is the own use for uh, the power plant to produce electricity, and then what is the electricity out of the gross electricity output of the net electricity output that we saw in previous cases in order to, in order to, that it's then used for for water desalination. I'm afraid I don't have a specific, you know, uh, advice or, uh, or, or uh, data on uh, uh, the, the efficiency that should have the power plant. So it's, it might be uh, related to uh, estimation. The, at that point, you might have to resort to estimation, but it's very important then to speak with the energy producer, with the company 
operating the power plant in order to understand all the technologies, all the characteristics, and to make the, the most accurate possible estimation of the electricity used for water desalination plant. And for sure, you, you will have a better view, a better angle to take all this, uh, this, uh, this problem than, than us. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you for the question and the observations on the Q&A. Um, I think you had prepared some uh, also exercises with Mark. Uh, we are a bit late, but I think they were uh, nicely uh, emphasized in some key concepts, including trade, which was also highlighted as one of the important uh, um, challenges in terms of data in the region. Uh, yes. Hello, uh, Robert, and hello, everyone. Uh, I will be going through the energy statistics and balances exercises. Uh, so this is basically just applying uh, the knowledge and the methodology that Nicola has been sharing during the last uh, few minutes. Uh, if you can go back to the menti that uh, was introduced in the beginning and use this code, it would be uh, it would be great so that you can reply in all the exercises with the answers that you think are are correct. So I think there is also a way for me to share the link. So you also have the link in uh, in the chat now. So if you click there, you should be able to, to access. Okay, so let's go to the first exercise. Uh, so this exercise is about uh, a natural gas site, which had an annual offshore production of 400 million cubic meters. Out of these 400, 50 million cubic meters were flared and 100 million cubic meters were vented. How would you report this data? So here you will have to remember some of the, of the methodology, some of the, the guidelines that Nicola shared regarding natural gas production. Options are to report the 400 million cubic meters in production and the sum of vented and flared, so 150 million cubic meters as losses. Second option is to report again all the production, 400, but then the 150 million cubic meters in the oil and gas industry. Third option is to report only the production minus uh, the flared and vented natural gas, so only 250 million cubic meters, but still the losses, we would report them in, in the losses part of the balance. And finally, the last option is to report only the 250 million cubic meters as production. So I see we have some different opinions, but uh, most of the answers are going to towards only reporting the production of 250 million cubic meters, even though the, the second most uh, voted option is to report the 400, so the whole thing, and then as losses, the vented and flared. So in this case, the correct answer is uh, to report only the production of 250 million cubic meters of natural gas and we do not report the natural gas that is flared or vented. So natural gas flared and vented are considered extraction losses. So these are losses that take place, of course, during the extraction of, of natural gas. And these are not included in the marketable production of natural gas, which is what we want to report in the, in the energy balance. So these, in addition to gas flared and gas vented, it would include also gas reinjected which is a uh, natural gas that is injected into an oil reservoir to increase the, the oil recovery. Um, so I, I hope this is clear. Let us know in the chat if, or you can take the, the floor if you want to ask any questions, but remember that natural gas flared and natural gas vented should not be considered natural gas production in the energy balance. Let's move on to the next question. So for this question, you will see on your screens an, an image, which is basically uh, an energy balance that I can show also in this image. So here we see uh, a few products uh, like primary oil and secondary oil products. And we see some flows regarding the supply. So production, imports, exports, stock change, and oil refineries. So here 
what we want to know is if you see any problems in the reporting of trade for these primary and secondary oil products. And if you do see some, which problems uh, do you see? So let's focus on trade. So of course on imports and exports, you can go, I recommend going product, product by product. So you can first do uh, crude oil. So we see in this country, we have uh, 10,000 terajoules of crude oil production. We see that there are both imports and exports and focusing of the on in the value of exports, we see that it's uh, relatively smaller compared to the production. So this seems like it could be uh, a good uh, reporting of trade. So you can go through this to the different products and write any responses if you have them. If not, I will go myself through the through the issues that there are in this energy balance. So there is one issue, I can give you this hint on, on natural gas liquids, because as you see, the production is 2000 terajoules um, and the exports, we see they are bigger than the production. So there is more, there are more natural gas liquids being exported than they are produced in this country. So we see, of course, there are imports in between. So most probably, what we can guess from this situation is that part of these exports, these 2,500 terajoules here, are actually um, transit trade. So it's amounts of natural gas liquids that have been previously imported that go through the country and that are then directly exported without being used in the country. So transit trade as Nicola presented and as is mentioned in the international recommendations for energy statistics, uh, should not be reported in the energy balance. So imports and exports, they comprise all the fuel and other energy products that are entering and leaving the national territory. But uh, goods that are simply being transported through a country, which are goods in transit and goods temporarily withdrawn are excluded from the energy balance. So then uh, we see the same situation for LPG. We see that there is no production of LPG, which we would see as output of all refineries. Um, and we see that there are exports. So this is very clear in this case that uh, these exports come from the amounts that have been previously imported. So this is again, transit trade. And finally, uh, there is also an issue in this case with NAFTA. We see that there is 1,500 terajoules that are output from the oil refineries and the value of exports is higher than this. So again, at least part of these exports are uh, transit trade. I see some of you uh, wrote some responses. I see, uh, I see some of them are matching with what I was explaining. So yeah, again, let us know in the chat if you have any, if you need any clarification on this. Uh, but yeah, I see that uh, some of you have, have seen the, the issues that I was talking about. Let's move on to a third exercise. So this exercise is about uh, LNG trade and what should each country report. So in your screen, again, you will see uh, some images which I will share here. So we have country A, which is a producer of natural gas, which uh, is uh, liquefying uh, towards LNG, this uh, 100 million cubic meters of, L of natural gas. These are being transported by an LNG tanker into country B. So country B has an LNG regasification plant. And then out of these 100 million cubic meters that it has imported, it will use uh, 50 million cubic meters for its own consumption. And then it is sending 50 million cubic meters also to country C. So the question in this case is what should country B and country C report? So options are country B should report only the 50 million cubic meters that it is using as imports. And country C should also report these 50 million cubic meters that it's using. Second option is that country B uh, reports all the imports, so the 100 million cubic meters and then exports of 50 million cubic meters to country C. And from the point of view of country C, it would only report uh, the imports of these 50 million cubic meters that it is using. 
Finally, we have a, a last option, which would be that country B reports uh, everything. So the 100 million cubic meters that it has received and country C does not report anything. So I see, again, the, the answers are quite uh, spread through the possible answers, but most of you are actually uh, replying to the second option, which is the correct one. So in this case, country B, and this was a, a case that was again explained by Nicola during the presentation, country B is the country that has a regasification plant. So it is receiving 100 million cubic meters of natural gas in LNG form and uh, turning into gas, so changing the, the physical state of this gas. So it will be the country of origin of this regasified gas. And it is reporting the, the 100 million cubic meters that it has received as imports and 50 million cubic meters as exports to country C. Then country C is reporting these 50 million cubic meters that it has received from country B as imports. So again, this is according to, to the methodology that we use, according to IRS and according to the to the IEA methodologies as well, which are compliant with IRS. I have a, a fourth question if there is time. So this question is about the correct reporting of fuel oil and diesel for different origins and uses. So again, there is an image that you see in your menti which is this one. So the situation is a refinery produces 100 terajoules of fuel oil and 200 terajoules of diesel. So out of these, 10 terajoules of fuel oil are burned to provide heat for refinery processes and 50 terajoules of diesel are burned in a thermal power plant outside the complex. So the question is how would you report all these values here? into the energy balance. In this case, a very simplified energy balance where we only see fuel oil and diesel, and we see uh, some flows which uh, are concerned by the values and the explanations that we have on the left. So again, if you see any uh, options on how to correctly report these values, you can write them in the menti as your answers. So. In this case, I will I will go through it myself. So the production from the refinery will be uh, oil refinery output in the energy balance. So what we will have here will be positive values of 100 terajoules of fuel oil and 200 terajoules of diesel. So this would be reported as the output of all refineries. Then uh, this 10 terajoules of fuel oil that are burned to provide heat for refinery processes. So this, since it's uh, fuel that is being burned for uh, refinery processes, which is part of the energy industry, of course, this will be considered energy industry own use. So these 10 terajoules would be reported here in fuel oil uh, energy industry own use. And then the 50 terajoules of diesel, which are burnt in a thermal power plant outside the complex. This we can consider since it's outside the complex that it's a main activity electricity plant. So these 50 terajoules of diesel would be reported here as an input to main activity producer electricity. So very important for these two values, they need to be uh, they need to be negative because it's input into the plants. So of course, this value into the main activity electricity plant and uh, the energy industry on use should be reported as negative uh, values in the energy balance. Finally, I have one last question, which is about uh, non-energy use and petrochemical industry. So a petrochemical factory used uh, three kilotons of naphtha as feedstock for the production of plastics. And also for this purpose, it consumed two kilotons of diesel. So how would we report also in the energy balance these different values and, and different data that we see? So how would you report each product in the energy balance? One option is to report the use of naphtha as non-energy use because it's feedstock and the use of diesel as energy use 
because it is being uh, consumed for its uh, energy content and it is being burned. Second option is to report the use of NAFTA as a non-energy use uh, and the use of diesel also as a non-energy use because it's in the petrochemical factory. Third option is only uh, to report the use of diesel as energy use. And the final option is to report the use of NAFTA as non-energy use, again, because it's feedstock, the use of diesel as energy use because it is being burned, and the production of plastics as non-energy use. So please choose one of these options. And again, I will show the correct answer. Oh, I see, yeah, most of you are, are answering the correct answer, which is uh, use of NAFTA because it is being used as a feedstock for the production of plastics and not because of its energy content, but because of its physical properties that will allow it to be transformed into uh, primary uh, chemicals that will be then transformed into plastics. This is a non-energy use in the balance. And then the use of diesel, because we are using it to for, for its processes, we are using it as a fuel that will be burned. This is an energy use, even though it's in a petrochemical plant. So in the balance, again, this needs to appear in, in the energy use. So this will be it from me for the exercises on fundamentals of energy statistics and balances. Please let us know on the chat if you have any questions. And if not, I will give back the, the floor to the chair to continue with the different presentations. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nicola. Um, I think uh, you are providing a wealth of information and this topic by itself would deserve a, a five day a week, I think, of explanation in methodologies um, because we are covering all the fundamentals of energy statistics, the energy balances, which is also a elaboration of the initial data. So it's more to give a sense of the importance uh, of certain methodology to really align data across countries. And that's why we also always refer to these international recommendations um, on energy statistics that have been adopted by the United Nations. So they are uh, our common language, really, I would say, in energy statistics. Um, so we hope in the future that uh, we'll get uh, opportunities to discuss more in depth each of the topics introduced in your session because it was very, very rich. Um, if there is no questions, I don't see any question in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I don't have it, yeah, the Q&A. Um, there was a question from, uh, yes, I, I, which I can read to everybody speaking about the Tunisian case. Wafa was asking if the balance is disseminated and there is a confirmation of that. So it's very nice to know also that um, the data collection work has a, a, a dissemination component as well, which is why we collect the data ultimately. So thank you for that clarification. I didn't read it before. So if uh, there is no question, I would move to the next uh, session, which is about trade, because um, our colleagues, especially from ESQA, they reminded us how important trade statistics are in the region. And so I would like to invite Mr. Majed Hamoudeh from ESQA to present on trade data on oil and oil products and the ESQA external trade data platform for the Arab region. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, colleagues in IEA, uh, RECRE, and uh, from member states, uh, good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is, uh, in fact, a pleasure to me to join you in this uh, session, although I, after the very informative presentations, I felt uh, that I'm really guest to this uh, group of uh, highly specialized uh, and distinguished uh, speakers and uh, attendees, okay? It's okay, uh, am I heard? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, so I will uh, just uh, give uh, in a nutshell uh, what we are doing here at ESQUA away from the energy. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the uh, a bit of uh, confusion about the presentation, the language. Uh, I prepared the presentation in Arabic for the Arab thought, the Arab uh, 
participants and it would be easier for them to, to get it in Arabic. But uh, it, it would be uh, good for the, uh, them to see me speaking in English and then they can see the material in Arabic. That would also help the um, translators, our colleagues, translators. Um, uh, okay, okay, okay. So I'll just uh, go quickly to what we are doing here. Um, I heard our colleagues, presenters before me, um, emphasizing the fact that getting data and reliable data and good data is uh, imperative for uh, making good decisions, and that's true. And that's where uh, we uh, endeavored in ESQUA to bring detailed uh, database on trade, of course, trade of everything, the energy products and the rest of products, everything that is traded internationally, and to put it as much in detail as we could, uh, and to be in the bilingual in Arabic and English, and uh, also to complement it with very useful uh, uh, visualizations uh, that uh, uh, can bring together uh, data to see it on the regional level, sub-regional levels, intra-regional, and on uh, groups, uh, groups of products, you can see it, uh, the total trade, I mean, divided by groups of uh, trade uh, products, and also uh, uh, along uh, economic grouping, groupings and uh, uh, regional trading agreements. So um, uh, we did this uh, database to cover a huge gap in the available data in member countries. Data is not produced usually by many member states on time or with the full detail that is required. And in particular for the energy products, there's always a huge problem facing uh, users uh, for this type of data to find it in the uh, full detail that they wish. So in, in, in our uh, database, we try to, to, to bring all these, to bridge the gap and bring all these points together and to provide a full consistent time series data and to standardize the classification that these products are classified upon, which I will talk in a minute. And, um, and this is the shape of the, uh, the platform, the interface that you can see. Uh, it's fully Arabized and in English and uh, ready to give um, the data on the level of the individual country as well as uh, uh, on uh, the, the product level. Uh, this is again the interface in English uh, where you can see the, uh, the reporter, you can pick the whole region as a region and see it's a trade, or you can pick a, a single uh, Arab country or multiple uh, reporters with the world again the partner country on the right side uh, also you can see the direction of a trade whether it is exports re-exports or imports the year and the economic uh, uh, the trading partners in terms of economic groupings or regional trading agreement this is when i said about the groupings we try to group the products in the full trade to be divided like among uh, between uh, 14 trading groups starting because our region is uh, very important uh, in the production and exportation of energy products mainly petroleum gas and their derivatives um, that's a group and then there is the um, uh, the petrochemicals the base metals and so forth um, you can see it and then you can see uh, if we are talking about the regional level the um, ranking of countries in that uh, in the product or in the totals, which is the most exporting country, the second, the third, and the whole ranking from top to down. And then you can see in terms of trading partners, if we are picking a product or we're picking the totals of exports and imports, you can see the trading partners, for example, here for the whole Arab region in 2021, the uh, top trading uh, a partner or the top export destination for the Arab products is the EU, EU countries. Then the GAFTA, the GAFTA, which is the Great Arab Trade Agreement, which is the intra-regional platform. And then 
the rest NAFTA, ASEAN, COMESA, and the rest. But you can see this on the level of the, the, the product, the country, or the group of countries. Then you can trace the total, the trade balance also on the total. And on every product, you can see the trade balance over the period we are bringing, uh, providing the data starting from 12, 2012. On the right side, you can see the top 10 trading partners, individual countries. So um, <clears throat> that's in a nutshell what we are trying to do. And uh, since last year, we launched this uh, uh, database, the platform for external trade uh, data statistics for the Arab region. And uh, um, now we are just maintaining that and updating that, uploading the uh, most recent data that we could. In a month's time, we'll be presenting for the whole region the 22 data. Now it is 21 when we access. Anyway, um, um, in, in, in a second, we'll be moving to a, a live demo from the platform, the data platform, that we can um, uh, talk a bit about how to use it and uh, what are the different uh, functionalities in that uh, platform. To start with, uh, talking about the topic now at hand, which is the trade data uh, relevant to energy uh, products. Uh, here we are talking about uh, the uh, trade statistics for the different um, energy products, whether it is the uh, hydrocarbons, uh, the gas and the uh, and, and the crude oil or the derivatives, or whether it is about the actual products uh, in, in final use like electricity, we have also captured that in this database, or if it is related to the uh, uh, trade in uh, uh, renewable uh, energy products, which uh, comes in a huge uh, classification because of the uh, diversity of these uh, products, which goes from the um, uh, the machinery, the equipments, and the parts, and so forth to uh, generate uh, electricity, uh, whether it is generated by wind, solar energy, hydro uh, or by, by water, uh, power of water, or other means. And the, um, the, the storage, the spare parts, the, every type of thing that could be classified under the, or related to the renewable uh, energy products. Now, to use this from the trade point of view, because I just listened to the, carefully to the, uh, presentation uh, before me, and it was very informative indeed, although some parts, big part of it, is not in my area, and the calculations of the energy balance and all that. But from the trade, international trade point of view, uh, all products, whether it is energy or otherwise, uh, should be classified, should take um, a, a, a code and uh, that coding uh, system is uh, prepared uh, under a convention, international convention, uh, that is uh, managed by what is called the World Customs Organization. I think they are in, also in Paris or Madrid. And uh, they produce uh, the full classification for every item that goes into international trade, exports, imports between countries and across uh, international borders. And uh, it is classified in a way to grab uh, the processing and the technology manufacturing stage on every group of products. It starts with the, the whole classification, I mean, which is called the harmonized system of coding. HS, HS for short, and Nizam al munassaq in Arabic, because we cannot find the short for that. So the HS coding uh, starts with the very primitive or the primary, let me say, uh, uh, processings. And we could imagine that the natural, the agricultural uh, products fall in the first group of uh, products classified there. And then goes to the high end technologies and value added and uh, manufacturing input to the most developed um, high tech industries and so forth. So uh, it is divided on what is called uh, sections. It has 21 sections. First section is natural 
uh, agricultural products, animal uh, and uh, um, uh, vegetable uh, and so forth products. It goes to section five, which is the most important section in, in uh, our or relevant to our work in energy here, which is called mineral products or mineral oils. And then in that, uh, you find there are many chapters, but the most important chapter for us is chapter 27. And chapter 27 of the HS, you can see uh, all the, um, uh, mainly the, uh, the products, uh, the hydrocarbons, uh, and their derivatives in uh, crude form or in manufactured or liquefied, you can find it there. For example, the chapter or the heading 2709, that's for crude oil. 2710 is for all the derivatives, gasoline, diesel oil, uh, jet uh, fuel at every level. And then the 2711, which is for uh, classifying natural gas, and it's also products. Um, this is on the four digit, we call it the HS at the four digit, which is at the heading level. And then we go to the classes, subclasses inside that should go into a bit of expansion to a six digit. And for example, this is a snapshot from uh, in Arabic for uh, the uh, the platform, which shows chapter, the section five, 27 then is the uh, chapter and then 2709, the headings. And you can see uh, the detail, detailing of all the products in there. Um, of course, we'll be going to a live demo in a few minutes uh, to see in English how, how that is uh, being uh, done. And then we see, for example, the electricity energy, which is finally product that is passed through electricity grids from a country to a country. And there is a huge, uh, or there is a, a major project in our region here in the Middle East that goes from Egypt to Jordan, passes to Syria, and most probably will reach to other countries uh, in the future. Electricity energy is also classified in this 27, although it does not have anything to do with mineral products, but tentatively, they put it here for future revisions maybe they will list it in a separate entity, not under the mineral products, hydrocarbons, I mean. Uh, so it takes uh, the heading 2716 electricity energy. For the rest of the uh, trade and products and data for products of renewable energy that we just talked about, they are uh, in diversity and uh, they fall uh, within different sections, but mostly we could trace uh, them falling in two chapters, 85 and 84, uh, that are uh, allocated to the machinery and uh, electrical equipment. And of course, in chapter 87, like vehicles, when you talk about electrical vehicles and their spare parts and batteries and so forth. <clears throat> So um, I, I prefer to go directly to uh, uh, a live uh, demo uh, to talk, uh, to save time. I hope uh, my screen looks a bit uh, small. I hope it's uh, readable uh, by uh, all. So um, this is the whole platform, which I said Arabic, English, and uh, full, uh, inter fully interactive and uh, where, um, so I will just talk directly about uh, to save uh, the time. I know the time is uh, not that much in my favor. I'll go directly and see, okay, this is the landing page. It gives you for the whole Arab region, the whole Arab region, the 22 countries from Morocco to Oman and uh, their trade with the world, exports and re-exports for the year 21, for the whole, I, we said partners, so it will not appear any economic grouping. It gives here the total of exports and imports. You can see it on the right side, the figure, which is 1.606 trillion US dollars. And then in terms of sections, where we said we have 21 sections, the top section we could see immediately, it's the mineral products, which 
uh, provides the data on uh, the oil in particular, crude oil, the derivatives and the natural gas exports from this region, which is uh, close to 60%, $631 billion out of $1.06 um, trillion, about 60. And we can see it immediately in, the, in this graph, the uh, grouping graph, where you can see the first, the top uh, product uh, category, it's the petroleum and gas products in terms of exports of, of this region. The least is the furniture, for example, uh, in comparison. The top exporter in our region comes here is the United Arab Emirates, followed by Saudi Arabia and Qatar. The Emirates, because we are calculating here the exports and re-exports, and they have a huge uh, amount of re-exports uh, because it's a, a trading hub with a huge uh, amount of re-exporting activities in, in, in Dubai and the rest of the Emirates. And then you can see the top groups, economic groupings uh, importing from our region, the balance asset, and the top uh, trading partners that importing partners from this region, where you could see, where you could see China, fifteen percent of the region's exports uh, are destined to China, followed by India, Japan, and Korea. And let's see, let's see, dig more now into the mineral products, and let's see uh, if you wish on the uh, a level of a country, we can just pick, for example, um, uh, Qatar or Saudi Arabia or, or any any country. Okay, the exports of Qatar uh, are amounted to 87 US billion dollars. 74 per, uh, uh, billion dollars are the mineral products. We know that they are the major exporter of gas, natural gas. Okay, we could see the 73 billion is yes, right in the chapter 27 here, chapter 27, the mineral fuels. And then if we dig more in detail to go to the heading level, we could see that 53 billions are in the petroleum gases in the 2711 that we talked about in this category, uh, less in the crude oil, which is 2709, like 12 billion US dollars. And then the derivatives, uh, gasoline and the, the stuff, uh, uh, 7.8 billion dollars rest is zeros this is the now if we want to see and dig more into qatar um, petroleum gases exports we could see we just up into the very detailed level that we have which you can see here on the six digits on the six digits we could see qatar is in the 27, 11, 12 petroleum gases and other gases had liquid, liquefied, liquefied and proven 53 billion US dollars. Okay, if we click on this one to see who are importing the LNG from Qatar, it's in the uh, SARC, uh, the, 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 the agreement in, in, in Asia. The top importer here is Korea, 17% or 18% almost, rounding figure, of Qatar imports are uh, import, exports are imported by Korea. India is the second, 16, and then China. The issue here, what is the input of ESQA here, is that those products and these data on this level of detail are not available usually. Maybe they are produced by the countries, some countries, but they are not published. If you go now and search for these at this level of detail per country destination, you won't find it. So here is the great effort that we did at ESQA in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, doing a, a, a different activities to bring this detail to the platform. Uh, we reviewed uh, and review every time multiple sources to, to get the data, including the ComTrade uh, uh, partner uh, data trade, uh, OPEC, and uh, the um, uh, different countries. Uh, I mean, not the national statistical offices, but the, the energy companies, the Ministry of Energies or Natural Resources. 
So we pay a lot of effort to bring this detail to the table, uh, to, to this platform to be there. And that's, I think, one of the major contributions that this platform provides for its users. And uh, of course, uh, uh, on the import side, let's say, let's say we want to, to see for Qatar, not Qatar, but let's, let's see one importing country for, for example, the renewable energy products. Let's see Jordan, for example. Okay. Deselect uh, Qatar and select Jordan. And let's deselect exports and select imports for the year 22 from the world. Let's see what is the code of, for example, the solar panels, which is 85 for 140, if we put this, and immediately the platform will grab for us the imports of Jordan in the year 2021 from all countries, all the sources, which is uh, amounted to 98 million US dollars. You can see immediately that Jordan is importing this top 95% the panels, the solar panels from China, followed by Thailand and 95% from China, actually. So, uh, and we can repeat this process for the any product that we wish to see. You do need even to go to the, uh, sometimes to some of the presentation, the, the visualizations, if you are getting just one product because it will give you just this product, this. Uh, um, okay, the, if you want to see which is the most country, Arab country, for example, in our region, interested in developing their uh, solar energy uh, facilities. And so you just deselect, deselect here, the region will go to the Arab region and we'll say imports the same stay. And then we just click again on the HS code and we go and highlight this. We find the whole imports of solar panels to the Arab region in 2021 amounted to one point one two billion US dollars. And the top importing country is United Arab Emirates followed by Qatar and then Egypt and Jordan, Lebanon and the rest. Uh, why the Emirates? Because Arab Emirates also import not only for the needs of the uh, Emirati market, but they re-export, as we said in the beginning, they are a re-export hub for the region. So if you see, for example, here, Re-exports, you can highlight here the re-exports and I have a comment on this. Yes, we see in terms of re-exports, again, uh, Arab, uh, United Arab country is, is, is exporting a lot of, uh, uh, of solar panels. Uh, this is in a nutshell, in a hurry, uh, how do we reach to the data of energy uh, products, the different categories using our platform and the advantages it provides. Um, if I go back to my, this is, um, this is the uh, electronic uh, website for our uh, platform, the ETDP at sqi.org. And this is my email. You can please uh, go through. And if you have any questions, you can write or call to us or any of my colleagues. We can pass it and happily answer any question. Thank you so much. We have already one or two questions. So I wanted really to take the small amount of time to to, to to read because this is extremely rich uh, database that we are showing and uh, you talk about the classification uh, it's very interesting even from the point of view of data collection I see that one question for example from Abir is uh, how do you collect the data that then feed the database and what is the difference with the com trade um, so how do you collect this data that they are so nicely displayed and congratulations for the platform because it's impressive. Okay, thank you so much for this feedback and thanks, Javier, for this question. Actually, this is the part that takes most of our work and effort. Firstly, 
we try to get as much as we can the, the raw data from the national statistics offices. But unfortunately, uh, they produce them either on the four digit level, which is not the detail one, the six level that I just showed you. Um, you can see that in, 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 in many cases. Um, and uh, what, what, we, what we can do at that point is for these countries, we do multiple effort as follow. In Comtrade, you cannot see this detail, for example, for the GCC countries, all of them that producing um, uh, and exporting the oil and the gas and the derivatives. You cannot see them at all. If you go up and, for example, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, United Arab, Arab, you will find a total, a total, or you find a total in the four digit. Uh, so you, you don't know how much is of every product that is going or the destination, you, ca you cannot know that. What you can see is if you go to the partner uh, data, you can see, for example, the Korea, South Korea, imports from every type of every product individually from Saudi, from Kuwait, from Qatar, as we saw, uh, they are the top importer of Qatar uh, gas products. So we try to combine all these resources together because one thing is, the data on Comtrade taken from the mirror uh, data is exaggerated by a margin, the margin that is uh, paid for shipping and for insurance and for profits and for you know all this uh, sales uh, uh, circle reaching from Qatar from the FOB price to until it reaches to Korea. It could be 20 or 30% higher than the actual price that is paid in Qatar. So we do a lot of effort of bringing these, um, um, these figures in line with the national figures on the four digits to compare and see the gap, the extra gap to bring the actual or something next to the, very close to the actual figures. Comparing them also with the production levels uh, of, of OPIC data to, to make it so much close together before we reflect them uh, in our database. So it's not an easy process. And I would advise uh, to, to have a look into the database, our database, and see what I'm talking about when you compare the individual uh, exporting countries' uh, data with the data that we have there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I mean, there are other questions, but I suggest that also you can answer bilaterally, especially on vehicle. Uh... Uh, consumption. I don't think this is the, uh, the appropriate uh, database, but no. um, yeah. But uh, I think it's very important to put some light on the trade, um, and it will be very interesting to compare actually monetary values with physical values that we are type. We are collecting energy statistics, and that there is a classification also um, issue in some cases. So it's certainly very uh, interesting to dig more in depth in, in, the, in this area because of the importance of trade in the region. So thank you very much for your uh, contribution. We are rather late, but uh, um, we are today the objective is really to give the flavor on different topics that could be dealt with in, in more time if we had more time. So it's not about really teaching all the details. Uh, uh, but uh, it's it's good to know that ESQA has developed such um, a tool that is available for use. So I would like to invite our next speaker from Recre. Um, um, if uh, you could also try to be uh, compact to the key messages on the renewable development in MENA. Um, I have, uh, um, I don't know if it is Nadia or if it is Eman Aden, um, probably Nadia, but... Um, um, Please uh, go ahead. Hello, everyone. This is Iman Adil from Wiki, and actually, I'm going to give you a um, small introduction about our report, AFIX report, where you can find some statistics and indicators about um, the renewable energy sector in the MENA region. First of all, if you don't know, um, uh, if not all of you know about RECRE, so RECRE is a regional intergovernmental organization covering 17 member states. We have operated since 2008 with seven member states and uh, our headquarters was in Egypt, Cairo. Uh, then we grow up till we reach 17 member states where 
we have uh, specific strategic uh, uh, aspects regarding renewable energy, energy efficiency, and overall the climate change in the MENA region. Um, during the, the, the key work, we have a regular flagship report, which is the Arab uh, Future Energy Index Affix, uh, one for renewable energy and another one for energy efficiency. And for the third time, and in line with uh, the long lasting partnership with um, uh, the UN organization, the edition of the Affix covers the three pillars of sustainable energy for all renewable energy, energy efficiency, and electricity access assessing the progress in the 20 Arab countries under more than 40 indicators, focusing mainly on the policies and the strategies. Um, it also covers the institutional and technical capacities and investment uh, environment. Apex is becoming one of the effective tools for the policy maker and uh, uh, in the Arab region and the evaluation and comparing the progress of their countries with the other countries in the region to make necessary reform to progress and achieve their national targets in cooperation with a strategic partner and in light with uh, uh, the um, uh, exchanging of the best practice among the countries. I would love also to highlight that uh, we have launched the first, uh, the, this this uh, uh, version of the Apex today at the MENA Climate Week uh, uh, in the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. My colleagues, Dr. Megid Mahmoud and Engineer Akram Mohammadi have launched it uh, today in the early morning. So this is uh, one of our hot publications now. Um, I would love also to mention that during the Apex, we have three sections renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy access, where we cover the installed capacities among the region, the renewable energy and energy efficiency projects, barriers, and the challenges. We also uh, uh, highlight some of the success stories, and we uh, mentioned uh, the grid access, the uh, applicability of the smart grid, and uh, the innovation ideas in the renewable energy sector and mix uh, uh, in light with the, B, the B2X and the green hydrogen innovation innovations uh, those days. In this slide, I would love to mention that 463 uh, million inhabitants, which is around 5.6% of the world population, growing from uh, uh, 222 million in 1999, which means that today the Arab population represents 5.6% of the world population, with 80% of the region's population and being concentrated in eight countries, which are Egypt, Algeria, Sudan, Iraq, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia, in addition to Yemen and Syria. The population in the Arab countries or in the Arab region is relatively young, with uh, adolescent and youth aged from 10 to 24 years, representing a quarter of the total population. And within that, the access to electricity in the Arab region was almost 91% in 2021 with many countries have reached the universal electricity access conflict and political uh, instability and utility sector mismanagement nevertheless leave nearly 42 million people without electricity access. Uh, of course, this is due to the instabilities, the political instabilities, and of course, also the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, the rural area suffered the largest deficit, actually was uh, only 83% of the population having electricity access compared to 98 in urban areas. And the rural urban divided uh, was most uh, prominent in Arab uh, uh, countries where urban electricity access was 84.5%, uh, while in rural access was only 52%. Around 52 million people in the Arab countries didn't have access to clean cooking with large sub-regional uh, uh, disparities. Going to the renewable energy, I have just to highlight here that we had uh, five pillars in our analytical uh, ethics. Uh, we uh, identify uh, uh, the market structure through the high-level indicators, then the policy framework, of course, we highlighted also the institutional capacity and the overall financial and investment reforms in the Arab region, in addition to the final carbon emission and monitoring protocols. Uh, in terms of installed capacities, the highest are Saudi Arabia, a target uh, uh, of 58.7 gigawatt by 2030, and Egypt target of 59.7 gigawatt by 2035. 
Uh, these targets represent 30% and 42% of share of the national installed power uh, generation capacities, respectively. And during this slide, you can figure out that there is announced a target by 2035 among our uh, countries with more than 200 gigawatt, which is a huge number and needs to uh, um, uh, rapid uh, 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 processes and instruction in addition to legal framework to uh, apply this. To be applicable, I mean. In this slide, we have just highlighted the installed capacities in terms of technology. So we have 3.9 gigawatts in wind, 7.4 gigawatts in PV, and 0.75 CSP. And uh, there is others like hydro and geothermal, 0.35 gigawatts. Excuse me, without hydro. So the total renewable energy capacity is 12.4, while the hydro is 11.2. Two, and the total capacities overall that have been installed till now is 23.6 gigawatt. And this slide, I just highlighted the renewable energy installed capacities, like in, uh, in, in terms of technologies, but I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to share that uh, um, uh, just one uh, point here that the renewable energy say reduced approximately 7% in the installed capacity. In this slide, I just want to highlight that we have uh, 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 several Arab countries conducted their tariff reform actions and make progress in inducing their energy subsidies in order to promote and catalyze the renewable energy and solar energy specifically, where the region witnessed an unprecedented wave of energy subsidy reforms. Uh, 13 countries have conducted this in 2020, while six countries have started early in 2014 with a total number of 19 countries from the Arab region. And this slide, I'm just highlighting the development and draft of uh, a NIAB. So there is uh, implemented NIAB in Palestine, in uh, uh, Lebanon and in Tunisia, while uh, the second phase of the NIAB, while the implementation of the first phase of the NIAB uh, is conducted in most of our countries, uh, the one in the light red here, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, um, and Sudan, Algeria, Morocco, and Libya. Egypt is still under the preparation of NIAB too, and the rest of the countries are still need more uh, uh, ambitious uh, plans to finalize their NIABs. Uh, last but not least, just, this is uh, just the numbers of uh, um, after analytical uh, um, methodology at Hukri during this Apex publication to uh, figure out the overall uh, situation of the Arab countries. We can say that we have 21 NIAPs in different stages, whether uh, phase one or phase two or even under preparation. And as you see, it's in Jordan, uh, Bahrain, uh, Algeria, Egypt, uh, Iraq, Lebanon, uh, Libya, Kuwait, Morocco, Djibouti, and even Mauritania and Yemen. And there is uh, 14 Arab countries with NIAB and national targets of the second page. We have 17 national assist, assigned entities for energy efficiency. And this is very important because last COP, in last COP uh, 27 in, uh, 20, uh, 27 in Charm Sheikh, uh, um, they have highlighted that um, the slogan was the energy efficiency comes first, should be taken seriously. And uh, we have also living countries that use the NIAP template, will, which will uh, lead at the end to uh, 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 monitoring and evaluation of the uh, previous NIAPs. And we will, of course, consider this in the upcoming NIAPs. At the last slide, I'm just uh, sharing with you the QR code of, uh, of the affix, so you can download it. And there is also like small video that summarize the overall affix, which could be benefit. And last but not least, I just want to thank my colleagues, uh, Dr. Megid Mahmoud, the technical director, and my colleague, engineer Akram Mohammadi, who was uh, on a charge of this uh, affix report, and also uh, in preparing such uh, amazing presentation. Thank you so much, and uh, I hope I wasn't uh, taking so, so much time. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Nadia. And actually, um, if there is so much information in this report that uh, we could spend, again, m longer time <laughs> on the details. <laughs> and your work was, is positioned really at the center of the priorities for the future because renewable and energy efficiency, you know, so uh, even the title is very appropriate uh, for the future, but and certainly very relevant for uh, this group of participants.
Ah, uh, there is a question from Abir that says, why, what about nuclear as clean energy? Of course, it's a clean energy, but you know that uh, nuclear is um, is very uh, um, few in the region, and uh, actually there is uh, some uh, um, uh, let's say initial plans for that in the MENA region, but it's not concrete yet to be considered as the apex. So, however, we have some data about it, and we are trying to figure out in the upcoming apex uh, if if you have uh, concrete information to be uh, included, of course. Ah, it's interesting to know that you are trying to look at that as well. Yeah, yes, of course, it should be. So I will thank you very much, uh, um, Iman. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure and honor to be part of this training today. And I would love to be uh, with you much more longer, but I have another commitment. Absolutely. I can join you later on. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, and um, I'm very pleased also to move back to the session of the IEA because now we have, a, um, we are back to a content on energy statistic and estimation of emissions with our uh, uh, expert Yua Kyokoika um, from the our group, the International Energy Agency Data Center. So from the balance, now we move to the estimation of emissions, which is so important, especially thinking of COP and uh, the transitions that we are moving into. You have, please. Thank you much, Roberta. So yeah, welcome everybody to hear about the greenhouse gas emissions estimates, estimations that uh, the IEA does, and also we are going to introduce a little bit the methodology that you can use. Uh, basically, first we we'll start with uh, having a short uh, discussion about why it's important to collect uh, emissions data and track the climate targets. And then we go into the two different methodologies that are usable, sectoral and ref reference approach, and then we have short conclusions. And basically, out of the source categories uh, in the 2006 IPCC guidelines for emissions estimates, uh, we define energy as so, uh, so that we have uh, fuel combustion activities, then we have fugitive emissions, and then we have also carbon dioxide transport and storage. So basically, uh, the category 1C here can also include a negative effect on emissions. So some carbon can be captured and there are some projects actually in the MENA region in Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the UAE on this also. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the source category of energy is uh, around three, qu three quarters of the total green greenhouse gas emissions globally. So it's quite important and very important part when we look at the total uh, climate effects also of emissions. So that's why energy is uh, such a big focus on, on the climate discussion. Uh, one important thing when we talk about uh, global climate targets and, uh, and measuring emissions globally is to have a harmonized uh, set of requirements. Basically, everything is based on the international recommendations on energy statistics, uh, which, uh, as you learned, is, is the basis for the energy balances. And from those, those data, the energy statistics data, we then calculate uh, the emissions inventories using the 2006 IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories. And it's very important that these uh, methodologies are used because they align with each other, so they are uh, they, they work together and that ensures that we will have a coherent set of national energy data uh, and that, that also needs institutional collaboration at the country level. Basically, the agencies or departments producing the energy data uh, will need to make sure that the same data is used also in the climate side of the government. Uh, I will not go to Menti for these questions necessarily to save some time. But basically, one question to start with is, uh, what is the highest emitter in, in MENA region, which sector? And um, could be transport, could be power generation, energy industry, could be industry, could be buildings. Uh, but the correct answer 
depends actually a bit on the country. For many countries, it's the power sector and the energy industries. But also for countries where uh, fossil fuels production is not as big part of the economy, actually transport and buildings also become very important. And something that we can also see here is that in countries where uh, fossil fuel sector is, is, is large, also the transport sector is uh, usually the second largest. And that's due to, for example, the fact that the production of, of fuels needs, needs also transportation of, of those fuels to different markets. So transportation of fuels is a big part also in these countries. Another uh, indicator that tells a bit about the economic uh, structure of the country is the carbon intensity of an economy. Basically means the emissions uh, divided by the purchase uh, power parity GDP of the country. Uh, and this gives an indicator of the uh, reliance on fossil fuels of the economy. And here we can see there is some, uh, it, it seems to coincide with countries where fossil fuel production is, is large, but also there's some variance here also. And now to co continue to how do we estimate the emissions? Basically, there's two approaches. Uh, we can approach the emissions from supply side, or we can approach them from the demand side. And the 2006 IPCC guidelines uh, give us two approaches for estimating fuel combustion emissions, which are basically the sectoral approach, which is a bottom-up approach. So basically from economic activity, uh, so demand uh, to emissions, and we have basically we have different sectors and we have different products and the transformation and final consumption for each of those. And from that, we can uh, estimate emissions for all greenhouse gases. Uh, and then we have reference approach, which is top down. So from the energy supply side, and of course, this is less granular uh, approach and it can only account for CO2 emissions from fuel combustion. Uh, when we go to, uh, when we start looking into fuel combustion more, uh, we can see that it's uh, actually divided, can be divided in the subcategories. So let's say energy industries, manufacturing, transport, and all of these, as you see, can be split even to uh, smaller categories, which is important in the sectoral approach to have uh, the, that uh, granularity of different consumption. And then we see the fugitive emission side and carbon capture side, there's also some split into different uh, categories. When going to the separate sectoral approach, uh, the main idea here is that when you have a fossil fuel, here a simple example of methane, uh, which con contains one carbon atom, when you combust that, uh, you add oxygen to it, and basically you get the result where the carbon is conserved. So here you can see one molecule of CO2 and then two molecules of water. And um, based on the these, because we know the chemical principles, we can estimate when you know when we know the mass of carbon contained in the in the fuel, uh, and we know know that the carbon will be preserved in the reaction. Uh, we also know the uh, mass of greenhouse greenhouse gases that's produced in the in the combustion. And this basically gives us the emission factor and which tells like how much uh, greenhouse gases are released per a unit of fuel combusted. And traditionally, usually in the sectoral approach, instead of mass of fuel, we use the energy contained in the fuel. So that's how we derive the emission factor. And how we use that in the sectoral approach in the tier one methodology is that basically we have a sum of all of the all of the fuels, and 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 for each fuel we have uh, the emission factor of the fuel times the consumption of the fuel times the net calorific value of the fuel, and this gives us the emissions from that fuel. And basically, uh, we as it is a bottom up approach, we include total final consumption, so combustion happen happening in industry and residential. Etc., but also the impact into, into electricity and heat production, 
and their own use because uh, of course the energy industry also uh, uses fuels uh, to power their own processes so that needs to be accounted to for and the net caloric value here basically means uh, the practical amount of energy received uh, when the fuel is combusted or the usable amount of energy received uh, this question will gonna be I'll, I'll quickly run you through it but we don't go to many here so if you have a car that combusts five kilogram of uh, motor gasoline per 100 kilometer how many tons of uh, co2 will be emitted in a thousand kilometer trip so basically we here know that uh, in a thousand kilometer trip, we will have uh, 10 times the amount of fuel, so 50 kilograms. And then we could uh, multiply that with the uh, net caloric calorific value of uh, 44 megajoules. And then again, multiply that with the CO2 emission factor of, of motor gasoline. And we will get to the first answer of 220 tons of CO2. So that's basically a simple uh, example of how to estimate emissions using the sectoral approach. Then uh, going to the next topic, uh, fugitive emissions. And these don't come from fuel combustion, but these are actually leaks of gases and vapors and uh, mostly uh, unintentional or at least uh, irregular. So these happen can happen during the ex extraction and exploration of fuels, the transmission and distribution, can be flaring and venting, can be happening in the refining and processing, and so on. And how do we, how can we estimate this? Well, th that becomes a bit trickier because there's different kinds of activities, can be volume of flaring, can be number of abandoned mines where gases are leaked, uh, can be, we can try to have a factor for refinery throughput, we can have pipeline capacity, and all of these will be specific also to the category of fugitive emissions, so solid fuels, liquid, liquid fuels, etc. Uh, so basically, the lowest tier methodology here would be to have activity data, so let's say a uh, number of abandoned mines, and then a factor for if you have X number of abandoned mines, uh, how, many, how much uh, is the leakage from one mine, for example, on average, and then you could arrive to a estimate of the total emissions and with the tier two tier three you would be able to use country specific data and then also direct measurements in the in the most uh, exact approach for the reference approach so this is the supply side approach uh, where we previously for the sectoral approach had the idea of uh, carbon uh, conservation here we are using the idea of mass conservation. Basically, all carbon that's input into the national economy, uh, either by production or imports, is 100% considered uh, to be released into atmosphere or diverted, so stored in the products, uh, in, in fuel stocks. And basically here we think that like 100% will be combusted. So that's not as accurate. Uh, as the sectoral approach, but it's it can be used for a benchmark to verify the results of the sectoral approach, because even though we would expect these approaches to produce slightly different results, uh, we wouldn't expect them to be crazy much uh, apart from each other. And this, the thing with reference approach is because we only assume all carbon to be uh, combustion and turned into CO2, we only get CO2 emissions from this approach. And one thing to remember for countries where biomass use is, is, is uh, large uh, is to remember that the CO2 emissions from biomass combustion, they are not included in the energy sector or energy uh, category emissions, but instead they go to agricultural, forestry, and land use sector. Uh, but the C, like the methane and nitrous oxide emissions should in, in turn uh, be estimated into the emissions uh, emissions category because those are not estimated in the agriculture and forestry and land use sector. Uh, getting some answers here. 
So basically the question was, uh, which of the following are true for the, the sectoral approach, but which was just uh, explained and whether it's based on energy supply data, uh, whether it's more granular than the reference approach, whether it accounts only for CO2 emissions and whether if it's affected by uncertainties in the uh, net calorific values. And uh, we can go to the answer, please. So we see that it's not based on supply data because uh, the idea of the sexual approach is that it is based on the demand side data and it's therefore more granular. Uh, and the sexual approach, uh, the reference approach is based on the supply data. So there, therefore number three is correct. And uh, it, the sectoral approach does account for other uh, GHG emissions too. Uh, it's not only for CO2, and it is affected, however, heavily by the net cal calorific values, because as you remember, uh, when you uh, calculate the emissions for each fuel, you use the net caloric calorific value of that fuel in that calculation. Okay, we can go to the next question. Thank you. So here we have the apparent consumption of, uh, and the idea of apparent consumption. I don't know if you can see the uh, the formula on the on the uh, left hand side here. Uh, basically, this apparent consumption is used in the reference approach uh, to estimate the consumption from the supply side. So basically, it includes the production and imports of a fuel minus the export minus fuels going to international bunkers, so the stocks of international aviation and uh, marine transportation, and, and stock changes, so uh, fuel that goes into storage. And basically, uh, from you can also answer here, but basically, when you calculate, this is from for Australia in 2021, for crude oil, and basically, if you go to the answer, next slide, Thank you. Uh, the last one is the correct one. And I think we can do maybe one or two more mentees. So here we can see the share of fugitive and total energy emissions in the MENA region. Uh, as we know, fugitive emissions, as they come from, uh, from the different uh, phases of, of, of fossil fuel, like the cycle of fossil fuels from, from well to tank, uh, we can see that uh, the emissions of fugitive emissions are higher in countries with uh, fossil fuel production. And uh, if, you, if you go to the next slide, can you name some sources of fugitive emissions? So now you can uh, feel free to write uh, if you know of sources where, where there might be leaks or involuntary or irregular emissions during either the transmission, distribution, or production of, of fossil fuels. Yes, all, all, all true. Well, agriculture, the emissions for agriculture go to their own uh, category, but basically if it's if it's a leak of, of uh, so basically, for example, a truck, the full, com full com fuel combustion of, of a truck is not considered fugitive. But if there is, let's say, if the container on the truck is, is some, somehow open and leaking oil or gas, that will, that will be a fugitive emission. And same for agriculture. If it's this kind of, of leak, it could be there. Okay, pipelines. Pipelines are 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 important part in here. Uh, possible leaks of pipelines. Okay, yeah. I think we can move move forward. Yeah. Okay. Just a second. I will here again. All good. So now to conclude, the key, key takeaways of, of this emission session is that the sectoral approach is the most uh, granular approach available. Uh, and by using that uh, and then checking it with the reference approach, uh, there's a 
good chance that if there are some problems with the data, for example, the differences uh, in those approaches could point to this and those uh, challenges in the data could, could, have, could be identified. Uh, some causes for this could be differences in, uh, in the activated data versus the supply data. So basically uh, what Nicola mentioned earlier, uh, the statistical difference, and then uh, un inaccurate net calorific values, uh, carbon content of different fuels, and, and maybe there is some some in the reference approach side, maybe some uh, carbon is included that should not be included, so that is not combust combusted, etc. And and the important thing is to make sure that the uh, the national energy data is uh, it, it, uh, is very good quality, uh, which re requires well resourced and well designed data collection in the national level and also the institutional arrangement. So making sure that the uh, people working on uh, generating the energy statistics uh, also work with the people working on climate targets and, and climate data so that the uh, na natural gas inventories are calculated based on the same energy data produced in the in the uh, energy energy side of the government. And that is basically it. That's my part for this one. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Yuha. Um, I think it was very, very clear. And um, you are highlighting here very important points, in particular thinking that many countries now, all the countries that signed the Paris Agreement will be invited to regularly report all the greenhouse gas inventories. And this is a sort of very important effort. And it strongly relies on good energy statistics, as you're pointing out. Uh, maybe some in the some experts in the audience can um, let us know whether they are uh, aware of national uh, greenhouse gas uh, measurement or inventories in the country, and whether the energy side is involved because this is uh, what you have told us. The, this arrangement is really important. Um, if there are national experiences, we'll be happy to hear. Um, in the, in the meantime, maybe uh, you, you mentioned also the difference between uh, carbon and other gases. Maybe you can give us one minute explanation on estimation, uh, for example, for methane that is so important and not so easy, as easy as the carbon. Yeah, thanks, Roberta. Sure. Uh, basically, as we saw before, uh, when we calculate the fuel combustion emissions, uh, we use and um, we for CO2, we assume uh, everything is oxidized. So all of the carbon going into the fuel combustion is, is becoming CO2. And, and we have emissions factors based on that. But for, uh, and, and CO2 emissions are usually depend, not, not depending on the technology or the process, they're usually consistent in this way. But uh, for methane or other greenhouse gases, uh, there is a great variance between uh, the emissions factors uh, depending on the technology used in the fuel combustion. So that's one one key different difference to be remembered when estimating emissions for other other gases. That uh, some things that are possible for CO two there needs to be more uh, maybe dedicated approach with the other gases and need to take into account that. If you want to be uh, have an accurate estimate, you would also need to change the emissions factors based on the technology you're using. And for methane, uh, that's also a big uh, part of uh, from the fugitive side. And it depends a little bit on what are the resources available for the country or for the entity uh, making the estimates. But basically, you could either use uh, emissions factors uh, that are estimated for another country and then use those with with maybe some uh, factors in between to estimate your uh, own when you know the uh, activity data let's say pipeline pipeline leaks you know the uh, type of pipelines and uh, length of the pipeline network you could maybe and the gas going going inside you could uh, estimate the leaks based on emissions factor from similar systems from other countries. But if you have the 
opportunity, of course, uh, let's say satellite measurements or also like direct measurements on, on the on site based on the technology used uh, can help to make the data more accurate. But a simple estimate can be also made using uh, factors calculated for, for another country where these measurements have already been made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juha. I think there is a lot of uh, work possible around the fugitive emission emitter. I also highlighted in the chat for those who are interested that some recent work of the International Energy Agency on tracking methane, which is also equally important in the future. But uh, thank you very much, Juha. This is an extremely important topic, and uh, um, we wanted really to include it looking ahead of COP coming in the region. Um, I propose that we skip the break uh, for the sake of time as we are late, and uh, I am very happy to give the floor to Zakia Adam uh, so that she can lead the second part of the workshop. Zakia. Thank you very much, Roberta. So, hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, we have seen uh, earlier in the first presentation of the IE how energy balances can be used to get an overview of the country's consumption uh, as they are available in almost every country. Uh, however, the, le the level of disaggregation of such energy data is not enough to monitor energy efficiency as we don't have enough detailed uh, information on, for example, uh, end users in the residential sector. So we need more detailed demand data and they are still globally poor. So I now invite uh, Domenico Latanzio from the IE uh, to talk uh, more about uh, end use data and um, energy efficiency indicators. Domenico, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Zakia. I'm sharing my screen. Do you see it correctly? And can you hear me? Yes. yes, okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Domenico Lattanzio, and I'm Statistics Manager at the International Energy Agency, leading the team responsible for the data collection on energy end uses and efficiency data. And today, with this presentation, I'm going to present what Zakia just mentioned, so the ongoing work on of the efficiency team on disaggregated energy end use in uses and efficiency indicators. This is very important to understand better what's happening in our countries. First of all, what is energy efficiency? Well, the simple definition of energy efficiency is that energy efficiency is using less energy to provide the same service. This sentence will be our light throughout the presentation. Why energy efficiency is so important? Well, we... Um, here at the IEA, we estimate that 40% of the reduction of the energy-related greenhouse gases emissions will come from efficiency, 40%. So it is worth creating some metrics to track it. But energy efficiency means also much more. We have um, different benefits from imp improving our energy efficiency. It has different implications in our society and our economy. It increases, for instance, um, energy security. Having less need of imports, I'm less dependent on the importing countries. In general, it affects also prices. If we have less demand of a specific energy commodity uh, with the same offer, the price decreases. And then it increases industrial productivity. Industries that invest in reducing their energy input are more resilient and competitive in the market. It increases also the employment. Most of the time, improving efficiency means employing more people. Let's think about all the renovation of the housing ongoing in different parts of the world. It brings home energy efficiency and it requires employees in the construction sectors and much more. There are no silver bullets in the energy world, but energy efficiency is what gets closer to be the silver bullet. Why then disaggregated data are key? Well, because you get what you measure. As you have seen the presentation of balances and all the presentations throughout the day, uh, balances are full of very interesting uh, information and input to policies. The balance gives me the overall energy behavior of the country, but we need to further disaggregate the data to draft tailored uh, policies. For instance, 
If you realize that the energy consumption for the residential sector represents a big share of the energy consumption in the country, I need to assess who is driving this consumption to be able to tackle it and reduce it. Is it cooking? Is it water heating? Or is it cooling? I need disaggregated data and indicators to, to, to set the starting line and to assess and verify the, the final result of my, of my policy. How to build energy efficiency indicators, what we can learn, from, learn from them. So as we have seen, we once we have disaggregated energy consumption by end use, we need to create our indicator. We used to define the indicators as energy consumption by end use divided by the relevant activity. So for instance, we can have an um, energy use for heating divided by space floor, uh, or we can have some indicators based on the production, the industrial production of a specific industry. Here, it's what, what we identify as the pyramid of our energy efficiency indicators. And from the top to the bottom, you have different levels of energy indicators. With the very top one, which is a very uh, a first proxy of the energy uh, efficiency indicators. So this is the fi total final consumption divided by GDP. This is not an energy efficiency indicator per se, but is the best proxy that we have whenever we don't have further disaggregation. Here, uh, the energy um, data center of the IEA, we have this data collection on indicators and we collect the different end use data to be able to create those uh, indicators at, at level of the energy intensity. So let's have a look what, um, why this is important. So, here is the index of the total residential consumption for a specific country. The blue line is at the top, represents the total residential consumption. It seems that through, across the years, it increases by 1%, but let's dig down and understand through the indicators if this is the reality. If we dig a bit down and then we create the first indicator, we can, we can have the dark blue line, which is the total residential per capita. And we can already see that actually the consumption tracked by this indicator decreased. So the, the, the consumption by population decreased. If we further dig down in uh, creating more accurate indicators and we get to the yellow line, which is the, the last one, we can see that residential space heating per floor area, which is the best indicator we can have for space heating, actually decreased by 25%. So, the first light blue line and the yellow line are telling two different stories. With the yellow line, uh, we have a clearer understanding of what's happening in the country, and we have more elements to say that energy efficiency actually increased in, uh, in the IA during this period. We have then disentangled activity and structure and all the drivers that, uh, that influences the total final consumption. So let's see how we uh, identify the different uh, drivers, so different activities and the different end uses across the four subsectors that we we track. So for industry, we have a number of industries that we we track, come spanning from iron and steel to textile and going through automotive and pulp and paper. Those divisions are uh, more than the ones that in, are included in the normal balances. And therefore, to create the indicator that we have uh, mentioned before, we need activity data that we identify as value added or physical production for uh, uh, industries such as the, the, cement, the cement or the steel industry. Here, some examples of the possible indicators that we can create with the, with the uh, data that we collect. On the left-hand side, we have the energy intensity per ton of, ton of cement for the cement industry. And on the right-hand side, we have the energy intensity per value added for the same industry. Those two indicators are complementary, and they can show um, they, can, they can show two different uh, information and give us more uh, uh, more information on the on the sector. Going to residential, for the residential, we distinguish end uses, as we have uh, mentioned before. 
we can identify space heating, space cooling, water heating, lighting, cooking, and appliances. The activity for this sector is uh, namely residential floor area, occupied dwellings, or population, and for some end uses appliances stock. We need to uh, pay particular attention to this sector because when we ident identify and we create an indicator, we need also to uh, select the right activity data. For this sector, what we want to, to have is the occupied dwellings, dwellings, because we don't want to overestimate the uh, energy consumption of the average dwelling uh, dividing by uh, a larger number, which are unoccupied dwellings and vacation homes. So we need really to identify who is the driver. For this sector is the occupied dwelling. And here are some examples of the, uh, the energy efficiency indicators for all the, those uh, end uses. Then transport. We distinguish transport segments and tra transport modes. So we have distinguish between passenger and freight, which is a difference that we cannot do with the balances, and then transport modes, road, air, rail, and water. And then we use the activity data that uh, namely is the passenger kilometer data and the ton kilometer um, uh, data. So this is a measure of how much the people have moved during the year in the country or how much the, the load, how much the, the tons have moved in, uh, have moved in the country. This is how we calculate the passenger kilometer and the ton kilometers. And basically we have the, the vehicle stock. We multiply by the average distance traveled. And then we multiply this amount by the occupancy rate in the case of the passenger kilometers. So we have uh, the number of kilometers done by, by the passengers and or the load factor for uh, having the indicator, the activity data that is the denominator of the energy efficiency indicator for, um, for freight. And again, here, an example of, the, of what we can produce out of it. For services, we can have two approaches. One is based on the end uses, so space heating, space cooling, and the other one by subsectors. So we identify the subsectors in services and we report the energy consumption for, for it. And the activity data for these sectors are again, the usual suspects, value added or service floor area with the addition of uh, some other activities such as the number of, of employees. And this is a, a, again, another example of indicators that we can create out of it. All of those data, once we have the good uh, re representation of the, the situation of the country, we can also create what we call the, de the decomposition analysis. We have all the drivers to disentangle the effect of the structure and the activity and isolate, isolate the energy effect. Here an example for freight and passenger transport. In the blue line is the energy consumption for the subsector. If we look at the passenger transport on the right, we can see that the energy consumption stayed in, uh, in the US more or less stable with some ups and downs and plummeting in 2020 because of COVID. If we disentangle the effect um, of the different factors, we can see that activity kept increasing uh, across years while the, top, the final consumption stayed more or less stable. And this was the, uh, the effect of the efficiency. So you can see the uh, green lines that goes down. It means that the activity, the major activity, the major number of people moving was counterbalanced by the more efficiency. We publish all of those indicators and those data in a, in a publication called Energy End Uses and Efficiency Indicators, and we have created a data browser for it. So I would invite you to navigate uh, our publications. I leave you here the links. We do know that collecting those data is challenging. That's why we have worked and we are working on tools that allow countries to flourish in this space. The first tool is the energy efficiency roadmap. This is a paper that will help countries to identify gaps and in institutional arrangements. This roadmap is intended for countries that want to assess and revamp or create from scratch their data governance uh, when it comes to end uses and activity data. Most of, the, uh, okay. Most of the time, those data sit in different institutions, not always the energy minister. And, 
I, I hear some feedback. Okay. Uh, different institutions, not always in the energy ministry. It might be the transport ministry, for instance. And therefore require a solid and clear data governance arrangement with clear objectives and mandate. We have identified key questions and key passages that help countries to evaluate their current data governance and design new ones. This roadmap includes also a description of the data governance of 11 among our partner countries. Here at the IA, we really think that we can make the difference conveying the experiences of other countries and assisting in restructuring the data governance. If you are interested in working with us to revamp your data governance, please don't hesitate to reach out to me on the subject. The second tool we are working on currently is the what we call the toolkit. Talking with countries, we have realized that most of the time, all the ingredients for having an initial disaggregation model are there. There is a country balance produced in the country and there are some surveys in place. But sometimes countries need help with putting together those ingredients and create the right model to have disaggregated the data. Therefore, we are working on a toolkit that can bridge this gap, elevating the, ele the level of analysis that can be done in countries and making uh, countries' policies better informed by data. The cool toolkit will consist in, a, uh, in an Excel tool and a manual that will guide you in through the modeling and a survey, a typical survey that you can uh, have in your country to have the data needed for the, the, for the toolkit. We will implement those models in countries that wish to work with us with a specific projects. If you wish to implement those estimation models in your country, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and we can understand how to create a, a doc project for this. I personally think those two, uh, two uh, kits are very important and very useful. So don't hesitate to reach out to us if needed. I will close my presentation here and I will be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Domenico, for this very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, given how energy efficiency is high on uh, the political agenda of many uh, countries, so I think that uh, the work that you will you have just presented can be very useful to countries, especially uh, the work that you have done on the um, on the roadmap to support countries in uh, in developing energy efficiency indicators. Um, so if uh, the participants have any questions for Domenico, uh, please do not hesitate to put it in the Q&A box or to take the floor. Um, especially we are very interested to hear from countries if you are currently uh, developing um, such data on energy efficiency indicators or if you are interested in uh, working uh, on this uh, area and how you can let us know also how we can support you uh, if there's any interest on your side to, to work with the IEA on developing those indicators. No question. There's a question again from Abir. Uh, Domenico, I don't know if you can see or I can read it loud as well. Yes, I can I can see it uh, from a beer. So is this CO2 kilograms per kilowatt hour could be an efficiency indicator in general? Uh, yes, it's a great indicator, the, the indicator of the amount of um, CO2 emitted by kilowatt hour because it's, it's getting, uh, it's the synthesis of what's happening in the electricity sector. We always need to be aware that um, that indicator also includes some shift in, in shares. So it's not an energy efficiency indicator per se. It's not measuring the increase of the efficiency in the power plants, for instance, that using natural gas, but is affected by the different in structure. So if we had before only coal and just like a little share of renewables, and then we will have uh, after a while, 50% um, of renewables and 50% of coal, then we will see this indicator decreasing, but you're not measuring the efficiency of the electricity system. You're just measuring 
uh, a change in the structure. So we need to also there to decompose, and we have some decomposition for that also in our databases. What are the effects? If it's a shift in the uh, in the structure, or it's actually an energy efficiency measure, which means that coal power plants, for instance, got better and got more efficient. So we need to pay particular attention to that. Thank you. Thank you, Domenico. Any other question? Domenico? I think then, uh, uh, anyway, you can con you can contact Domenico. I think he, he can share his email uh, through, the, through the chat. Uh, and now um, I propose that we move to UNESCO presentation. Uh, we have seen earlier with the presentation from ARCRI how renewable energy such as solar PV has seen a considerable uptake in the MENA region in the past years. And uh, however, it's still very difficult to collect data uh, on their use, but there are some uh, new data sources and methodologies that can be used. And uh, so um, if it's still possible, I invite Mr. Christophe Wana from UNESCO to, to present um, on how to estimate solar energy. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Christophe Rohana. I'm here today to talk about using new data sources to estimate solar energy data. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay. all good. Uh, so uh, solar energy is a rapidly growing source of renewable energy, and it is important to have accurate and timely data on solar energy potential and generation. Uh, this data can be used to make informed decision about solar energy deployment, uh, grid integration, and energy policy. Uh, it's a growing source of renewable energy in the MENA region. However, estimating solar energy can be challenging to due to the lack of traditional data sources. Uh, here I'll explain, uh, actually I'll give a brief uh, on the content of the presentation. First, I'll tackle the new data sources for solar energy estimation. Second, I'll uh, be talking about the benefits of using new data sources. Uh, I'll give an example on SGGO AI tool on solar panel detection. Uh, as well, I'll give a, a list of open sources tools for solar panel detection. A couple of case studies, uh, the challenges and the opportunities uh, for using the new sources of uh, collecting data. So uh, for the new data sources uh, for solar energy estimation, let's uh, dive deeper into these data sources that are enhancing our ability to estimate solar energy potential. First, there is uh, satellite imagery. This is a powerful tool in our arsenal. Through satellite imagery, we can identify where solar panels are being installed around the globe. Not just that, it allows us to estimate the potential solar energy of a particular area and keep track of solar growth of solar energy adoption. The vastness of space giving us insight about our own planet. Quite fascinating, isn't it? Uh, then there is weather data. This is crucial. Solar energy, after all, is significantly impacted by the weather. By analyzing weather patterns and data, uh, we can make informed prediction about solar energy generation. Additionally, this data aids us in identifying prime spots that are mostly conducted for solar development. Uh, there is uh, IoT, Internet of Things data. In the era of connected devices, our, uh, very solar, our very solar panels are becoming smarter. Through IoT or, uh, or Internet of Things, we can meticulously track the change, uh, the energy generation and performance metrics of individual solar panels. And with machine learning in play, we can process vast amount of data from these devices to precisely estimate solar energy potential. As well, there is social media data. Now, uh, this might uh, come as a surprise to some, but social media can be a goldmine of information. It can be used to identify areas where there is interest in solar energy. As well, there is crowdsourced data. Last, but by no means least, we have the power of the crowd. People across the globe are contributing uh, data on solar panel installation and their respective energy outputs. Uh, the, this grassroots level information can provide us with invaluable insights and ground truth. 
Each of these data sources on its own is powerful, but when combined, they present they present us with unprecedented view in the world of energy, solar energy. Sorry. Uh, moving on to the benefits uh, of these new data sources, they are transformational. Here's why. So first, uh, there is an increase in accuracy and timeliness. Uh, with these new sources, we're not only getting data, we're obtaining precise and timely insight. Imagining, imagine having a, a, an intricate understanding of solar irradiance and related par parameters all updated in real time. That's the power of these sources offer. As well, there is reduced cost. Traditional data collection and processing methods can be expensive and time consuming. But now we're stepping into an era where obtaining critical data is not just quicker, but also far more cost effective. Uh, there is as well the granularity in estimation. The, the devil is in the details, they say. These data sources allow us to dive deep, providing us a granular view of solar energy potential down to individual rooftops in some cases. As well, there is improved understanding. Finally, this new wave of data doesn't just benefit us on the commercial front, it helps us grasp the broader implication of solar energy on our, our, on our power grids, on our environment, and on our communities. In essence, as we adopt these new data sources, we're not just optimizing, we're revolutionizing our approach to solar energy. Here, I'll give an example of a tool that we use at ESWA. Uh, it's an S3J AI tool on solar panel detection. I'll give a brief uh, detail about uh, this tool. S3Geo AI is a suite of cloud-based tools that enable users to perform machine learning and artificial intelligence tasks on geospatial data. The solar panel detection tools uses deep learning to automatically identify solar panels and satellite imagery. It can be used to create maps of solar panel installation, estimate solar energy potentials, and track the adoption of solar energy over time. Uh, how S3Geo AI solar panel tool works? The solar panel detection tool uses a deep learning model that has been trained on large data set of satellite images containing solar panels. This model is able to identify solar panel uh, and images based on their size, shape, and spectral, spectral signature. Uh, the outcome of the tool is uh, from using this tool are profound. Not only does it provide a highly accurate map of solar installation, but it also offer, uh, offers invaluable insight into the potential of solar energy in different regions. By analyzing this data, we can observe trends, identify pa patterns, and make more informed decisions in the realm of solar energy. Uh, the benefits of the solar panel detection tool are various. Uh, the first one is accurate and efficient detection. Uh, the tool efficiency is unparalleled. It can swiftly and accurately detect solar panels, handling vast terrains with ease. Whether you're looking at a cozy neighborhood or an expensive city, SGGO AI tool doesn't waver in its performance. Then there is scalability. The beauty of this tool lies in its adaptability. Regardless of the scale of your project, it is equipped to manage, ensuring no area is too minute or massive for analysis. And then you have cloud-based and user-friendly. Operating in the cloud, it offers uh, the convenience of accessibility. Its user-friendly interface ensures even those with, uh, new to GIS find it approachable. I'll uh, later give you an example on this. And there is integration capabilities. One of most notable features is its compatibility with other GIS softwares, enhancing its utility and application range. Then there is data-driven planning. Beyond just detection, the data garnered becomes a pivotal resource laying the foundation for energy policies, grid planning, and infrastructural advancement. And then you have the cost effectiveness. Let's not overlook the financial perspective. By minimizing the reliance on manual surveys and on-site data collection, significant savings are realized. As well, there is uh, the benefit for uh, <clears throat> planning and development. Some of, uh, some of the other benefits are solar energy planning and development, streamlining projects from inception to execution, then research and analysis, offering data-driven insights for better solar understanding and policy and regulation, guiding decision at government level, ensuring sustainable and efficient solar practices. Uh, here's a short and brief guideline on how we used it and anyone can actually apply it. So we first, you need to have uh, access to ArcGIS Pro, 
Second, a high resolution aerial or satellite image of the area of interest. And for the steps that you have to follow in order uh, to process these, to detect solar panels using uh, the SVGO AI tool for solar panel detection, you have to first open the SVGO AI tool for the solar panel detection in ArcGIS Pro. Then you have to select the image that you want to analyze. Third, you have to set out the output feature class where the detected solar panel will be saved. Fourth, run, that's it. So the tool will process the image, detect any solar panel that are present, and the detected solar panel will be saved as a feature class in the map. Here, I'll provide uh, a brief uh, list of the other open source tools, solar uh, uh, open source tools for solar panel detection. There is Sunroof, an initiative from Google, and then we have Open Solar Map. Uh, it's a testament to the power of collective knowledge. It's crowd-driven database, continuously updated, enriched with solar panel installation from around the world. Then you have Solar GIS. It's a comprehensive platform, offers more than just detection. It brings a myriad of tools to the table, aiding in estimating the potential of solar energy, complete with a detector and energy calculator. Then, however, the standout in the list is Deep Solar, a product meticulous, uh, a product of meticulous research by Stanford, using advanced deep learning methodologies. It identifies solar installation with precision from satellite images. Uh, I'm going to talk as well as an, on another tool, which is Amazon AWS Solar Panel Detection. Uh, shifting our focus to Amazon cloud-based solution, the AWS Solar Panel Detection service is an epitome of leveraging deep learning. It accurately pinpoints solar panels and satellite images. Uh, two instrumental services in this domain are recognition, an image analysis tool that can discern and categorize objects, including solar panels. There is SageMaker, not just a machine learning platform, but a complete ecosystem to train and implement models specifically for detecting solar panels. Uh, as well, there is Helioscope. Exploring the world of open source tools, Helioscope is a gem for those passionate about solar energy. Beyond merely estimating uh, solar radiation or PV production, it's a holistic analyzer that empowers users to assess solar energy potential anywhere. Moreover, it doubles as a design and optimization tool, ensuring solar systems meet the highest standard. Notably, we collaborated with the NDP on a project to install solar panels at a select hospital and provided a case study for each, or for each one using Helioscope. Uh, another tool or a new method of collecting data, which is web scraping, can be used to collect information on solar energy announcement, such as new solar project and government incentive. This information can be used to improve the accuracy uh, of the solar energy estimates. Uh, then uh, we have to mention as well, incorporating a solar aspect in the household survey. The integration of solar data and household survey, this offers insight on solar panel ownership, consumption, and attitude. Such information not only refines solar panel energy estimates and validate machine learning models, but also guides policy. With the climate challenge ahead, it's vital to understand household interaction with solar energy and identify barriers to adoption. Uh, here, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, there is several case studies. Uh, I'll show them. And they are listed here. First, we have the World Bank Global Solar Atlas. Then there is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory System Advisors Model, SAM. Then you have the Solar GIS Solar Atlas, which was a cooperation with the World Bank. Then there is the World Resource Institute, uh, which is using satellite imagery and machine uh, satellite imagery and uh, leveraging uh, machine learning to gauge the global roof of solar potential. Then you have the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory that taps into crowdsourcing to quantify solar panel installed in the US. Innovative methods are driving our understanding of solar adoption and potential. Uh, nothing wrong without the challenges. So as with any journey, the path to solar powered future comes with a set of challenges. Ensuring the accuracy of our data stays ahead in the technological race and winning the hearts of and minds for broader solar adoption are just few of the hurdles ahead. The challenges are quality and consistency of the data, maintaining and privacy and security, addressing computational demands. However, with collaboration and innovation and determination, the future looked not just bright, but solar bright. <laughs> uh, data is not just numbers on sheets, it's a bedrock of strategic planning in the energy sector. 
with precise data, policymaker can design initiative that resonates with real world challenges and opportunities. Infrastructure investment can be more targeted, ensuring resources are channeled where they can make the most difference. And for the end consumer, data-driven outreach means programs and incentives that truly really cater their needs and aspirations. Uh, the domino effect of harn harnessing solar energy powered by these uh, innovative data sources is so profound. Economically, we're talking about job creation, local enterprise simulation, and more. Environmentally, the transition to solar is a monumental leap towards reducing our carbon footprint. Moreover, from a geopolitical standpoint, the move, the move towards solar aids and energy independence, re reducing our reliance on imported fuels. As a conclusion, new data sources can be used to improve the accuracy and timeliness of solar energy estimates. This can support a variety of applications, including solar energy planning and development, solar energy research and analysis, and solar energy policy and regulation. In conclusion, the journey towards today's discussion underscores one fundamental truth. The interplay of data and technology is revisualizing our social landscape as we tap into innovative data sources from geospatial AI to household survey. We're not just estimating solar potential, we're crafting a brighter, sustainable future. This transformation isn't the result of solitary endeavors, but of a collaborative synergy. Each one of us, whether we're devising policies, developing tools, conducting research, or simply using solar energy in our homes, plays a pivotal role. Solar energy isn't just the promise of cleaner power, embodies the vision of a sustainable world, robust economies, and striving communities. Together, guided by insight and driven by purpose, we can make this vision a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe, uh, for this very uh, interesting uh, overview of all the different uh, sources that countries can use to estimate uh, solar PV. Um, this looks very promising, and I, I hope that there will be uh, uh, trainings to support countries in using, in learning how to use those tools and, and to apply them. Um, I don't know if you have time to take some questions. Uh, and. Uh, I, yes, I can. Yeah. So I see there's a question from Abir. Uh, did you do any verification between the output from the tool and the actual ground data, for example, mainly for the huge solar plants? Uh, yes, so we have so we have data for uh, solar solar farms in the Middle East, and we did a test uh, in Lebanon on what we got. So the machine learning model is trained well. Any other questions? Uh, okay, Abir, see. Um, I see a raised hand from uh, Darlene Edeme. Um, Darlene, can you unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much for the presentation. Very, very interesting. Uh, I just had a curiosity with respect to the web scraping uh, approach that was presented quickly in a slide. I was just curious to understand what's the methodology there first. Um, if you have any specific case study project that you could describe in which you applied this, uh, which were the results? And particularly, I'm interested in knowing if you were just like the web scraping and the satellite imagery identification uh, are two separated things, or you're also trying to um kind of match them so on one side having the satellite finding i don't know information about specific um solar facilities and finding information about that specific facility through web scraping I... sure so we used we used web scraping to to gather uh, data on uh, solar farms across the arab region which is uh, various then we ran the model uh, first uh, based on, uh, I think, the model that was set for the United States. And we got pretty much 90% exactly the same results. So it was just a validation tool as well. It is a source of a new way to collecting data in case uh, we didn't run the, the, the model. Okay, but just to clarify, so 
I'm imagining the pro the process. Uh, tell, tell me if I'm wrong or I'm missing some step. So you look for like on the internet, there is the automatic web scraper that identifies a new plant that has been developed. You find the coordinates for that, and yes. then you look for the satellite imagery and you try to validate the fact that this plant has been installed through satellite imagery processing. Correct. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to check. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Darlene. Uh, I see there's also another question uh, in the chat um, from Seidu. So uh, the question is, since you use the characteristics of the spectrum of the images, can the deep learning models you presented differentiate the installed solar modules by type of technology? Polycrystalline, monocrystalline, and amorphous. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's also another question from Abir. How do you uh, differentiate between the operated and just installed? Yeah, so we do a time series analysis of uh, satellite imagery. So, so, uh, so uh, if we take the satellite imagery in 2019, we know that these panels are installed in 2019, then we do, a, we do the same model or we run the model in 2020 and we get the output for 2020. Thank you, Christoph. Um, I think uh, on the question side, uh, that's it. Um, I don't know, Wafa, if you will be staying uh, till later or if not, maybe you would like to say a few words. Uh, we cannot hear you. I will. I will stay uh, just to be with our participants if there's anything that you know we can help with. So I'm. I'm on. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, so thank you again, Christoph, for this very uh, interesting and innovative presentation. And now we will move on to the next uh, presentation um, on uh, energy prices. So as we have seen, energy prices have uh, followed significant events uh, uh, since the past years. The last year itself, following the energy crisis, we have seen how energy prices have spiked uh, significantly in most countries of the world. And at the IEA, we work very closely with governments in order to collect energy prices across not only member countries, but also from non-member countries. And uh, today I invite uh, Pedro uh, Carvalho from the IEA to talk more about um, the work that he's, uh, he's doing on energy prices and also the methodology of the IEA for prices uh, data. Over to you, Pedro. Hi, Zakia, thank you very much. So today I'm gonna be talking about energy prices and the work we do here in the IEA and the Energy Data Center. So I'm Pedro. And this is our agenda for the prices presentation. And firstly, I'll go through some recent trends. Then I'll talk about the IA methodology, uh, then a little bit about the database and some key points to remember. So when you speak about energy prices, uh, we are talking about uh, basically how real events can affect uh, energy products prices so for example in this in in this graph that you're seeing on the screen uh, you can see the the crude oil brand trends over the time and how the the events affected its prices so you had the oversupply and also more recently the covid and also some uh, recent hikes in in europe in general for example so not only that, they also affect uh, uh, our daily lives in general as uh, drivers for inflation, for example. And here uh, we collected a few headlines from uh, inflation in, in Saudi Arabia or fuel prices in Morocco or here in France as well. 
and more recently the global inflation uh, rises. So in our database, uh, with the data that we collect, as Zakia uh, well pointed, we have a database that comprises data for all globe. So with our database, we are able to build the figure that you're looking at. So this has gasoline prices in US dollars per liter for many countries in the world. And when you look at that, you can clearly see the different prices in dollars per liter in different regions of the globe. And for the MIA region, for example, a uh, consumer is expected to pay an average uh, 43 uh, cents of dollar per liter, uh, whereas uh, a consumer in Jordan would pay 1.63, for example. And it's very important to point out that they represent a very significant parcel of country's GDP, accounting for around an average eight between eight and ten percent. So, very quickly talking about our methodology here, uh, when we talk about en energy energy prices, we are talking about end use prices, and these prices they are basically made of two main components, the X tax component and the total tax, in which the total tax we subdivide it into VAT and excise taxes. So the excise taxes, they are usually uh, results of government's policies uh, and they are usually put in place for specific purposes. And they could be environmental taxes, uh, CO2 taxes, motor fuel taxes, and so on. And for example, sometimes we have different taxes for different energy products uh, or a single excise tax for most products, which is the case in, in Israel, with the only exception of electricity. And the main difference between the excise tax and the VAT, which you're going to see in the next slide, is that the excise taxes are divided on a volume basis whereas the VAT is divided on value basis and it's applied to uh, 174 countries in the globe as of 2022. And it's usually refunded to intermediate customers as industry. And for some countries we have uh, another tax that's an equivalency of that. But for the sake of our database, we include both of them, all of them in the same, in the same tax component. So speaking of our database, uh, database is basically divided into two main data sets. The first one is the energy prices that covers 141 countries in the globe. And the second one is the energy prices data set that's focused on OECD countries and has the taxation breakdown. So for most countries in MENA region, in our database, you find the total price, the end use price, but not necessarily the taxation breakdown, which is not something that's not necessarily always available. And we also have uh, comp complementary data sets, namely the monthly prices excerpt and the energy prices taxation information. So just to give you uh, an example, here you see the data coverage in the database for mid-grade gasoline and electricity in 2022. Uh, from the map, you can clearly see that uh, the coverage changes if you look at different products. So also, if you change the year, it's going to be different. And more specifically, if you change the time granularity. So for example, if you start looking at the monthly or weekly prices, you're going to have a lower, lower coverage than the one you're seeing on the screen for the same products. And if you zoom in the MENA region, uh, you see that we have a relatively good coverage for a few countries such as Algeria or Saudi Arabia, but uh, we still have uh, many room for improvements. And even the ones that we, we get the data, as I mentioned before, we only have the taxation breakdown for OECD countries. So we could enhance our database by collecting more more taxation data. And, but where, where is that data coming from? 
uh, and this is basically coming from official sources. So energy ministries, national statistical offices, central banks, and and so on, uh, or or even like direct submissions, or we get them from the websites, from the ministries' websites, or statistical offices' websites, and so on. And usually, uh, the data are for the global database is available for residential, industry, and transport sectors. And here you see some uh, examples of sources. So the first one is the Statistics Tunisia. Uh, the second one is uh, Saudi Aramco for Saudi Arabia. Uh, another one is the Egypt Statistical Office. And finally, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources of Jordan. So just going very quickly through some key points to remember. The first one is our concept of end use price, which is the price paid by the end use customer. It's base is basically made of two components, the X tax price and the total tax. And the total tax is made of value added tax, VAT or its equivalent and excise tax. And when you talk about uh, specifically electricity and natural gas, it's extremely important to clarify that the end use prices that we're talking about is not the same as tariffs. So the tariff is usually a fixed rate at which the products are sold and the end price, they represent the average rate per physical unit or energy unit. So they include uh, more, more components than the tariff, like uh, the taxation and uh, even the subsidies and rebates. So a few points that uh, I would like you to keep in mind. Uh, the first one is that this to set up the data collections might take time. The methodology is extremely important. So if you look at our website, uh, at the our data product website, you find the energy price documentation, which is basically a word document that we describe everything that we do, how we collect the data or sources or methodology. So this, this is very important in terms of transparency, transparency and also to give a solid ground to our users. And the third point here is that the taxation breakdown can help us and the world understand the prices collected. So for example, if you, you, your government is establishing a new, measure, a new measurement that's going to cap the prices by reducing one component of taxation, the taxation breakdown is going to therefore help you understand how this is being uh, filled by, by the, the end use consumer. And another point is that here we deal with multiple prices and taxation frameworks. So this is another thing that uh, you, you, you can help each other and you can benefit from by bridging this this open channel with us and in the end basically all the main challenges of the data collection they are linked to national capacity and given the relevance of energy prices it's very important to structure uh, data collection and to build up the national capacity so Finally, uh, I'd like to say that we are more than happy happy to contribute with, with you on your national capacity development and would be very happy to hear from you. Uh, if you have a data collection place uh, for energy prices, how is it? And if you are available to share it with the IEA. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pedro, for this um, very useful presentation on uh, energy prices and tax on taxes. Um, your points to remember was very on point. I think uh, we are very interested in learning more what the countries in the MENA region are doing in terms of prices, data collection. Uh, do you have a system in place? Uh, and also, if... Uh, and are interested also in working with us on developing those uh, prices and taxes uh, data. 
anyone in the countries that are here in the participants would like to share um, the experience on prices or just tell us if your country is doing any work on prices data collection. We would be happy to hear from you. Um, Any questions for Pedro on, on the topic? Everything was clear. Uh, maybe one uh, clarification uh, for me, Pedro. Um, you talk about uh, VAT, excise tax, um, uh, excise yep. prices. Uh, but can you tell us a bit if uh, subsidies are taken into account in uh, in the prices? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Nakia. Uh, so the objective of our database is to uh, understand what's the average end use price paid by the end use customers. So therefore, uh, our prices they comprise the subsidies as well, and these are included in the excise duties component. Of a process. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro, for, for the presentation. I, I see Wafa has a raised hand. Uh, Please, Wafa. I want to add and to, to, to mention that the inflation, the, C, the CPI, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I just want to mention yeah, I just want to mention that the CPI that's collected by countries is very important. And uh, specifically, for example, maybe uh, our member countries can have more information on the uh, gas and uh, oil in the CPI basket. Uh, so it's not only the prices and the inflation, but also to gather like uh, what Pedro was saying, more detailed information maybe as um, to keep them for their analysis and uh, you know for for their um, for their use uh, and and unfortunately a lot of uh, countries are not publishing the CPI as as it should be but it's a very important I mean uh, indicator and uh, a lot of things are linked to it uh, so just to encourage that more data on on prices should be there and what we presented on trade on the values if we don't have the prices we can't get like the quantities and the um uh, and the calorific uh, values and that so this is very important to link all this data together thank you dear thank you wafa very much for for this uh, point um are there any participants that would like to contribute uh, otherwise, Pedro, uh, maybe you can run some of the mentees uh, that you had prepared. Oh, I adapted them to the presentation as we oh. were running out of time. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, then I think we can move on uh, to the next uh, and last presentation. Uh, on our side, um, so uh, it's really to continue with uh, with the inno innovative data collection strategies. Uh, so after the presentation from UNESCO on solar PV, uh, we also would like to present to you uh, geospatial data, uh, which can also offer precise location and time data uh, to analyze various sectors and trends. And uh, today we have uh, Darlene Edeme, uh, African analyst at the IA, uh, who will be able to uh, talk more about the potential of geospatial data. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Darlan. Uh, I work for I'm African Energy Analyst, so my work is specifically focused on on Africa here, the modeling team of the of the IEA. But also my expertise is specifically on uh, GIS data, geoinformation system data, and uh, I wanted to uh, take this opportunity in, uh, during this wo this workshop. Uh, to focus a bit on uh, what could be the uh, help of uh, geospatial data 
uh, in the energy sector with a particular focus, of course, on uh, the MENA region. So the, okay. So first of all, um, the first point is that I'm really glad that I saw in the previous presentations uh, that GIS, GIS data were basically already almost um, introduced. Um, so uh, I think I will do a step back and just talk first on how, what GIS data are. And uh, I think the presentation from the colleagues from the United Nations on uh, the identification, for instance, of uh, solar infrastructure already gave me a real life example of uh, uh, what are the applications in which um, GIS and geospatial uh, analysis can be can be applied. So um, first of all, what are geo geospatial data? When we talk about geospatial data, uh, we are talking about data that have a spatial component. Uh, which means that these data not only give us uh, specific piece of information, but they also uh, additionally give us an information about where uh, those data refer uh, refer to on the space and in particular on the on the planet uh, in which we are. So whether it's like locating a city or a map or plotting the course, for instance, of uh, migra migrating species, uh, this data brings uh, another dimension to our data set that most of the time can be like latitude and longitude um, and stuff we are all used to even outside, let's say the energy sector. Um, what GIS does in practice, uh, it's it goes really beyond uh, plotting points and lines on, on a map. It's just, um, it's really a critical, let's say decision-making tool that uh, is currently used across industries. Um, again, not only energy, of course, urban planning, healthcare planning, agriculture, uh, and of course, energy uh, are sectors that are leveraging a lot on, on GIS data right now. Um, the, so uh, I will go through a bit of the introduction on GIS and which kind of data we see uh, in, this, um, in this specific category of data and how they can be used in the MENA region. But again, the one, point, one at least application was already uh, introduced. So first of all, what is GIS data? I said, these are information that have uh, a particular and additional, let's say, feature, which is the location of those data on, on the planet. Um, it's uh, um, so you can you can really think about basic applications that you are you have in, in your daily life uh, when you use a GPS, when you are asked to your phone um, through either Google Maps or other map services uh, providers where you are on the planet. Uh, there are different, there are specifically two types of, of GIS data. One are called vector data, uh, which are then uh, classified in three different types of, of data. Uh, some of them are points. So you can see here, for instance, locations of different uh, um, facilities. So police officers, pharmacy, supermarket, a restaurant, pretty intuitive. We have latitude and longitude. We are pretty used to that. We have lines, so if we uh, superpose, let's say, to these points, an additional type of vector layer, it's the, um, these are lines, uh, and they can be used, for instance, for roads. Of course, these are roads in, the, in, this, uh, in, this, in this image. And then the third component, the third type of vector data can be polygons. Uh, and in this case, again, it's the third layer that I'm adding here, and these represent uh, the buildings in an area. So these, I think these are pretty intuitive data. Um, most of the time, uh, vector polygons are used um, to represent discrete information. So it's nothing continuous here. We only, we know the location of those infrastructure, like facilities, et cetera. Um, but then sometimes there are kind of there are specific type of information that are not discrete and they are um, they are continuous on the space or on a subset of the space and these uh, for this kind of information um, GIS uh, specialists let's say but in general people working with GIS uh, they prefer to use raster data uh, to represent this kind of information. What are rasters? Uh, rasters are really grid based data format. Uh, in which we have each cell, which is also called pixel. And that's also 
um, like to give you an example, of course, uh, images are a type of raster data in which we have a continuous um, information, which is represented with a grid-based uh, data format. So raster data can be used and can be, for instance, derived also from polygons data. So in this case, for instance, if I start from the previous layer that I showed you, um, which uh, represents the number of polygons, for uh, polygons in this case of buildings in an area, if I start counting the number of polygons, for instance, in so in this case of buildings in each of uh, these squares, these pixels, and I can represent this information through another type of data, which are basically raster data. So as I anticipated earlier, uh, we have a pixel which has a specific resolution that can be meters, uh, kilometers, and then they have a specific value assigned to that pixel that can represent uh, a continuous uh, information. In this case, it could be, for instance, either the population in, that we estimated uh, living in that pixel that, for instance, we can derive by the number of buildings multiplying by the uh, average household size in, in that area. But if, as you can see, through this kind of information, we can really display uh, this data in a completely different manner with respect to the vector data. And we can, for instance, this is Alger, see uh, the difference, different density in terms of population in a city. So identifying pretty easily, uh, and this is basically what we call uh, uh, spatial analysis, so identifying uh, areas in which we have the highest uh, density. So in this case, this is a neighborhood in which we see the yellow pixels, which have which represent uh, places that um, reach a value which is very high, which is 354, for instance, people every 100 meter uh, per one, every pixel of 100 meters um, each in terms of resolution. So this is, for instance, where uh, what I was showing you earlier. So. The question here is how do we create GIS data? Because I wanted to really have my my presentation to show you how you could, uh, in case I assume some of you or most most of you maybe not familiar with GIS data. There are different ways, so different ways and different steps in order to produce um, reliable and consistent GIS data. The first part is the data collection. So you can do it through different methodologies. Sometimes there are information that we can go uh, and identify, let's say, uh, by doing, like going, let's say, on the field. So we have uh, what we do, uh, in, like what is done in, in many sectors, which is basically field surveys. So going uh, directly on the field with a GPS device, for instance, and geotag doing what we call geotagging, which is basically um, identifying the latitude and longitude of a specific point in the space. Uh, we can have user-generated data. Um, for instance, if we have um, surveys in which people were asked to specifically uh, say, for instance, an address uh, of, uh, uh, for instance, a solar power plant, um, we can, by finding the where is that specific address on the space, geotag that. So to say this information refers to this specific address, which has this longitude and, long, uh, and latitude on, on the, um, let's say, on the space. And then the last way, which is most of the time used when we are dealing with areas in which it's difficult to go uh, with field surveys, or sometimes these areas are very areas are very big, so it's difficult and not cost effective to do uh, such large field surveys. We know, like when we do censuses, etc., how costly those exercises are. So sometimes, uh, what we do is identifying uh, what we finding this piece of information through analysis of satellite imagery, uh, which again was really an application that was uh, very. Uh, detailed, detailed uh, very well detailed in the previous uh, two, two presentation behind. Of course, once we have collected this kind of data, uh, we need to process them. So it's not just the imagery, which is um, important, but the fact that, for instance, from an image, I can identify solar panels. Um, and then I can say, okay, there is this uh, solar PV uh, plant in this specific location. There is the georeferencing and, for instance, also the digitalization of physical maps is something which is done when, for instance, in the past, when GIS technologies and in general IT and ICT weren't 
that advanced. We have many maps that were done physically. What we try to do is to process these, uh, these maps, which are physical, and translate them into digital, um, to a digital format and into files, GIS files, so geospatial files that we can use um, for our work. And then, of course, uh, data storage, because, uh, but again, since the focus of this entire workshop is data, I'm pretty sure these concepts have been and will be uh, even more uh, detailed in, the, in the, the next presentations and next week, next days. Um, so please feel free to write in the chat if you have any questions with respect to that. What I wanted to show you are specific uh, geospatial data that are used in the energy sector to give you an idea. I think some of these might be trivial and you already might guess it, but I think also for people that are not familiar with this, um, could be a, a nice way of seeing which kind of data you could be using your in your daily life. So we talked about vectors and rasters. So in terms of vectors, as I said, discrete information, we could be talking about locations of power plants, substations, fuel stations. We could have pipelines. Uh, so not only points, but we could also, for instance, have lines, so rail routes, shipping routes, exploration zones. So again, polygons in this case, we could have polygons depicting, for instance, which areas we think are um, suitable, for instance, for uh, either wind uh, power production or geothermal reservoirs. We can have, uh, of course, also regulatory and policy zones, which are polygons that represent specific areas that have uh, very specific and dedicated, for example, regulations and restrictions. So for instance, an area which is a national park in which it's not possible to uh, install and build any power plant, for instance, or at cross with uh, transmission and distribution grids uh, lines. This is definitely an information that has to be taken into account while, for instance, estimating or assessing, um, doing pre-feasibility studies for um, installation of a power plant. And then, of course, energy consumption points when we do planning. And I think if some of you work with uh, some of the utilities of your uh, in your country, of course, having the precise location uh, and information about industrial zones, urban centers is paramount in order to uh, correctly plan, for instance, the extension of the grid or the densification or the scaling up the reinforcement of some of those grids, because we know, for instance, that there are plans for expanding an industrial area, building a new mining facilities or uh, oil extraction facility. Uh, switching on the raster type, as I said, we try, we use them for continuous information representation. Uh, in this case, what we have is, um, for instance, terrain analysis. So what we you could be using are um, raster files that says with a specific resolution, what's the elevation um, of each of those points, for instance, in a country or in a region, um, and then use this information again to plan accordingly infrastructure because of course elevation is an aspect that has to be taken into account. Same thing for the land cover. So you could have different pixels uh, with different categorizations saying this pixels, pixel is predominantly uh, a, for a forest. So it's covered in forest or it's a built area, it's a desert. So you could use this information to do uh, location specific analysis and identify, for example, areas in which the land cover is suitable for installation of um, energy facilities. Thermal imagery uh, is very similar with what was presented earlier, uh, which is through satellite imagery, identifying areas in which, for example, the solar potential could be high and could be, um, this could be like a, a proxy and an indicator for an area in which, of course, solar PV uh, exploitation could be, um, could be cost effective. And the same for resource distribution. So uh, I will skip this just because I'm, I will show you an example very soon. So. Just some examples here. You can see uh, from OpenStreetMap, uh, the open source alternative to Google uh, Streetmap infrastructure. Um, on in this case, it's uh, um, transmission and uh, distribution grids, and you can see how by using some very basic, let's say, uh, data visualization techniques with the color code for the different um, vo uh, voltages of the power lines, different symbols for the different types of power plants. You can uh, really do, even just by looking 
at the the maps and the imagery uh, to have uh, an overview of what's the power system um, of this area. In this case, I'm depicting the neighboring neighboring uh, neighboring area to uh, El Cairo. Um, but by applying GIS specific techniques, you could, for instance, identify those areas in which we expect, for instance, the demand to grow in the future and uh, accordingly plan a new additional or enforce the existing, uh, for instance, this distribution grid because we expect the demand in those areas to increase a lot because uh, of new, new facilities and new anchor loads. Going back, for instance, to the, um, so another example, but in this case, talking about raster files. Here you can see this is, uh, it was also mentioned earlier, the example with the solar um, solar potential. In this case, I'm focusing on the wind speed. So this is, uh, it comes from the same source that was mentioned earlier, which is a project from the World Bank, which tried to assess the wind power potential together with the solar potential on, in the world. And you can see here how this information is in a raster file because basically what we have is that we have a value that is translated in a specific color coding for wind speed at 100 meters. And you can see here the legend that goes from zero uh, to more or less uh, 10 meter per second in terms of, uh, of wind speed at 100 meters. This information is assessed through satellite imagery, taking into account, like using uh, very complex models that take into account the morphology of the of the, the land in those areas and um, studying how wind could develop based on uh, the height at which you could put like a wind turbine and the neighboring uh, morphology of the, of the territory. So very quickly, how to implement this in real life? I, of course, in so, with such a short presentation, I don't want to, my plan was not to be exhaustive um, in understanding how to build up um, GIS and integrate GIS in your work. But here I gave you, uh, and of course, I think this presentation will be shared. Um, you see many resources for different type of applications. So you have GIS, so proper, proper um, tools that uh, help um, analyzing most of the, the type of data sets that I've been mentioning. You have options to do remote sensing, which is the identification, like the, the usage of satellites, um, commercial or non-commercial satellites to identify uh, specific infrastructure or to do spatial analysis. Spatial analysis, of course, so dedicated softwares, uh, pieces, of, pieces of software that are dedicated to do um, customized analysis that sometimes maybe with, so, uh, with softwares that have a predefined methodology, you can't completely customize and automate um, the work that you, you would like to do. And then other resources, for, exa for example, to create maps and visualizations to obtain uh, data GIS data. So here you have a very comprehensive list of resources that you could look at and then other relevant tools, for instance, to do uh, serve, like to, to create databases and to um, have servers that have been um, specifically designed and calibrated to work with GIS data and to GIS data processing. Quickly, challenges and opportunities. I think they are more or less the same as when we talk in general about data, but some of them are specific to um, the GIS sector. I will go through them uh, very quickly. Data accuracy and integrity. Again, I'm pretty sure this is something you've been already talking about. Interabil interoperability. Uh, this is very critical for GIS because have you, as you've seen, uh, GIS data have very different formats because I told you about two, but then uh, also both of them have very different uh, type of, of format as a sub subtypes, so let's say. Uh, we have, of course, resource limitations because most of the time GIS data are very, very huge depending on the resolution and processing them can be uh, very time consuming and resource intensive. Um, of course, data security and privacy and regula regulatory frameworks. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, opportunities. First of all, enhanced decision making because with this kind of data, you're able really to plan not only taking into account the big picture, but being as much as possible location specific when doing the, the type of analysis um, you want to do. And then of course, all the rest, which is the fact that uh, it, we really need interdepartmental collaboration between ministries, 
um, public engagement to use this GIS uh, data also for the general public because they have this advantage of being relatively easily understandable if you do and represent them in a manner that is uh, uh, quite intuitive for non-experts. Capacity building and international partnerships, I think through the IEA, the UN, ESCWA, RCRE, there are uh, a lot of uh, institutions working on this. And I think uh, by reaching us, um, we can be able to support you towards uh, the specific applications that you would like to, to develop. I will leave the case studies an, an, as an annex. As I said, um, we will uh, share the presentation if it wasn't already done, but you will see two specific applications that uh, also the IEA has been working on to give you an, examples of, an example of uh, what you can do with GIS. Thank you. I hope I wasn't too long and also I was, that I was clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darlene, for, for this presentation on GIS. I'm sure many countries have found it useful and would be uh, trying to, to apply some of the tools that you have shared with, uh, with them. Um, I see there's a question in the, or two questions, mm -hmm. questions in the chat box. Uh, yes, uh, I see. Uh, let me open them. I can also stop sharing my screen, I think. Okay. So, um... Q&A box. Um, in the chat, there's one, are you planning to disseminate, disseminate uh, this data? OK. Um, so which I'm not sure which data you're referring to. The JS data that the IA has? Yeah, any analysis that the IA has. Maybe yes. a little bit more about uh, what the IA has been doing with JS data. Yeah, so maybe I can actually uh, quickly use the slide that I put as, a, as an annex, uh, just because I think they can give an example of some of the applications. So for instance, one specific uh, analysis we've been doing in the in the recent, sorry, just too many animations here, um, in the recent, uh, the recent period has been the, the sorry? Uh, just quickly, because we are. Yeah, yeah. So just an example of this is the global methane tracker. So we have partnered with NASA and other agencies to basically use their uh, tools to identify uh, leakage from methane extraction and uh, operation in the oil and gas sector in general. And through that, for instance, uh, these data sets are available and we have an alert a system that uh, every time that there is a huge leak uh, flare flare uh, activity, for example, uh, inform the, the, um, the key stakeholders about that. So definitely, uh, I think right now, the IEA is one of the go-to places, let's say, for data. And we would like also to uh, strengthen, let's say, the GIS component of this. As I said, most of the data are ultimately JS data, because also the prices data that Pedro uh, was showing earlier, when you represent them on a map and you say, this is the price for this country, this other country, you can also go sub country. Um, it really gives a completely uh, different level in terms of detail of the information that you can, um, you can provide to users in the sector. Okay, well, thank you very much, Darlene. Uh, we will share the presentation with the with the participants, and they can reach out to you as well uh, for more questions. Um, and now we are reaching the end of this uh, workshop. But uh, if you can see in the chat box, we have shared with you an evaluation survey. Uh, it's a survey monkeys. <clears throat> uh, survey that will take you just a few minutes to fill out, but which is very important for us because it allows us to improve ourselves for, for future uh, workshops. Uh, also, I see that we have um, uh, our partner from the United Nations Statistics uh, Divi um, Division, Leonardo, uh, who is the chief statistician. Um, I don't know. Okay, I see Leonardo, you're here. Uh, would you like to say a few words? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> hi, Zakia. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm not the chief statistician. I'm the chief of energy statistics in the statistics division, but fine. I'm Leonardo Souza uh, from the United Nations Statistics Division. Uh, 
it, it's located in New York. Uh, we have an energy statistics program and we cooperate with the IEA and ESPA. And that is why I was given the opportunity to introduce myself here, to which I am grateful. I welcome this uh, energy data workshop of IEA, ESPA, and SCREEE to MENA countries, which only helps our own work. Uh, our mission is to advance uh, energy statistics systems in the countries, and we do it through uh, data collection, the national coordination and cooperation, capacity building, and methodological work. I hope you had a fruitful workshop today, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you, Leonardo. Um, now, uh, before I pass over to, to Roberta for some concluding remarks, I would like to thank, uh, to thank all the interpreters who have helped us uh, during this workshop. So thank you very much, Maya, Elin, Oberi, Asma, Musa, and Cynthia. Uh, and now I pass over to Roberta for, for some Battery high. No phone is connected. Thank you, Zakia. Um, well, uh, I, I think it was a very, very nice uh, collaboration, especially um, of, among all of us uh, around the, the interest of this region, which is so important. Uh, and um, we really want, as Leonardo said, to uh, improve the data that will improve also our global understanding of the energy landscape. So primarily, I think we would like to thank uh, the um, UN Esqua and Recre to um, help us uh, in, in this uh, um, collaboration and also UNSD, Leonardo, because we know that uh, we always work together anyway. So I, I see this more as a sort of a pilot project for a future strengthening of the collaboration on data in this region. And I hope that this is the same vision from the other uh, partners and also the participants of the, of the workshop. Um, I would like to thank the team at the IA. Uh, there has been a lot of work, uh, Audrey, uh, Karim, Mikey, uh, Zakia, uh, and uh, Nadim, and Angelina, and other colleagues probably. So a lot of the people, the speakers uh, um, from across the organizations, I cannot name them all. And especially thank the participants, hoping that we'll uh, hear from you also later for a collaboration in data work. Nadim, any including words or Wafa, if you want to say one word. I won't be long. Just thank Sorry. you. Thank you very much. Please thank Wafa. you from our side. Please Wafa, go ahead. No, no, just to say thank you also. We're very happy for this cooperation. Uh, we stopped for a few years, but it's time that uh, we get back to the countries and see how we can support. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And I, I wanted also to stress on the fact that also beyond statistics, uh, you know, the Middle East and North Africa program at the IEA focuses on a range of of, of, of different topics and activities. Uh, again, all of them are under underpinned by good by good quality data. Uh, we've had the chance to uh, work with many of you in the region, and we hope to continue to do so. And please be assured that uh, statistics will remain a key element of our cooperation and our technical support in the region. And thank you all, and notably to um, uh, the, the participants, um, the colleagues at the UN Esqua and uh, RECRE, and of course the UNSD for, for the support, and, and we hope to continue working together in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. I wish you all a nice uh, afternoon and uh, hoping to, to meet you again for future activities and workshops. Thank you, bye.